Nectar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> got to get the intro going. What is going on? What is up? We got Steven Andrade in the house. That's right. In the movie dojo, hanging out with the samurai guy on a Friday night. Brother, how are you been? And welcome uh, to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. How about you? Great, great, great. Just having a crazy, crazy busy week, man. Videos and edits and guests. Guests, you know, that is very, very has the gift to... uh make you know awesome creative artwork uh, you know uh, uh, quick, quick, quick segue to the guest that we have here amongst us but yeah man uh thanks for coming in and hanging out uh with the movie dojo army here and uh yeah you know it's funny because uh <laughs> i had a few other artists on here before like dan mumford and and it's kind of funny because um uh how i discovered your art is actually kind of hilarious to me so I'll, I'll get, we'll get to the story here but before before we get to my story, what what was the calling? When did you get the calling? Like, <laughs> I need to pick up the brush, the pencil, and start creating the glorious art. <laughs> well, when did that I mean, happen? I mean, as as cliche as it is, like I feel like I've been drawing all the time ever since I was young enough, you know, old enough to pick up a pencil or whatever. I remember uh, I had when I was a kid, I always had a lot of comic books around the house. I think like some of my parents' friends like just gave them a huge box of old comics, most of them no covers. But I, I grew up reading like Spider-Man and Batman from the late 70s and the early 80s. And so that was the first thing was like, oh, superheroes. And then from there, moved on to discovering like Super Friends and the cartoons and things like that. That's right. And then uh, I went to school, um, graduated from art school back in 99 uh, with the idea I was going to go into children's book illustration. And I spent a few years sending out samples and getting nothing back and doing like what most people who graduate from art school do. You take a job somewhere. And I was working in an art supply store. Um, and, uh, you know, again, just like trying to get some work and things were really going nowhere. And then I just decided, you know what, I'm going to start painting some things that I enjoy for me more than what I think other people might see. There you go. And I started getting into doing um, more pop culture themed stuff. And uh, not long after that, I discovered Gallery 1988 in L.A., um, kind of like the the name for the pop culture art gallery. There's a there's a whole bunch of other ones that have come up since, too. Um, and I saw their stuff and I said, I, I feel like this is a good match. So I sent them a couple samples of things I had done just for fun. I had a spinal tap piece that I did just for me. Um, I had a, a Flash Gordon, like Sam J. Jones piece that I did. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite guilty pleasure movies. Oh, yeah. And they said, uh, and they <laughs> said, you know, OK, yeah, we'd love to see more of your stuff. And um, my first show with them, I believe, was 2012, uh, the Crazy for Cult show. Uh, they had done it a pop in a pop up shop in New York. and I did a piece inspired by tim burton's ed wood movie and uh it went over really well the piece sold i then i was like wow this is this is cool i can do some more of this and then shortly after that as i was doing work i started getting more and more into the pulp magazines of the 1930s 40s and, and early 50s and i decided to try to mash, mesh my love of pulp magazines with modern movies or you know at least contemporary movies yeah. and pop culture and uh, i started doing my my fake pulp covers which have um su surprisingly to me because it's always like this is stuff that i find really cool and i'm always amazed that other people find it cool and i'm incredibly yeah. gratified um and it's really started to take off and i'm <laughs> you know it's led me to have uh this past september at gallery 1988 i had a solo show um, where I focused on reinterpreting 80s movies and TV with uh, pulp covers. And it, it did 
far better than I ever could have hoped. So um, I feel like my direction is is doing pretty well, and it's it's gathering some fans. So I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Hell yeah, man! Hell yeah! And uh, and it it it, it, you, it is correct. You know, where it states on your Instagram where pop culture meets pulp. You know, <laughs> or the reverse. I probably said it wrong, but it, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it works. But yeah, that's what it is. It's very fascinating, man. I really, I was like, man, I never, I don't think I've honestly seen a mixture like this before, to be honest. And it's very, it's very, very original. Well, thanks. But, but I, now it's time for my story of how mm -hmm. I uh, came across your artwork. So this is pretty funny now. Well, it's fun, more funny to me, but <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. All right, samurai guy. I know the guy who likes action, martial arts, horror. He must have seen one of my cool, badass, you know, artworks or prints or something like that. What got what 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 made him notice me? Right? Are you ready for this? I want to hear ready? it. Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. Yes. So good. yes. <laughs> yes, my buddy. I see that one clip, and all I can think of is Mystery Science Theater. Like, yeah. does this bug you? I'm not touching you. Yeah. <laughs> does this bug you? I'm not touching you. Oh, God, do, yeah. do something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's really funny because my buddy, uh, he knows how we are in Mystery Science Theater. Me and my wife are huge Mystery Science Theater fans. I mm -hmm. mean, Mystery Science Theater might be the greatest show of all time. It's definitely I mean, up there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just so good. And... I always use this movie. Oh, we got some of the movie dojo army in the house. What's going on, guys? Frank, Heather, Kaiju, what's going on? Uh, but it's it's funny because when people always say to me, man, I saw that movie. That movie was the worst movie I've <laughs> ever seen in my entire life. And I'm like, really? Waterworld? Really? <laughs> Waterworld's the worst film you've ever seen in your whole life. Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? And I whip out the whole Manos, the Hands of Fate story, and I show it. I show it to them, and they can't. They tap because <laughs> people, people. When you watch a lot of movies like like we do, mm -hmm. right? There's different levels of bad. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. There's there's yeah. bad movies that are uh, just bad movies, and you're like, well, that sucked. That was a waste of time. Yeah. Um, I want my hour and a half back. Right. There are bad movies that are just so bad it's like a car crash and you can't look away and then there's yeah. the ones that are so incredibly yeah. bad like manos it's like god it's hilarious it's it enters like a realm of a realm of genius that is uh accidental you know <laughs> it's like people talk about ed wood's movies but like i don't know compared to compared to that manos is just it's so many levels above there was a, a perfect storm of just incompetence terrible acting and just you know a lot of like w2f tf moments of like oh what? yeah i know oh we got here oh, we yes, got manos a, kaiju saying it's manos uh miami connection is a masterpiece here. I, have, <laughs> I recently saw that um i watched it through the filter of the mst3 guys yes. doing the riff tracks of it because i don't think i could have sat through it <laughs> without it but yes um uh, my favorite oh, part of that one is the guy uh strumming the bass yeah yeah and uh, strumming the bass strumming you know? the bass the strumming air bass <laughs> yeah doing air kung fu it. kicks on stage oh and dragon sound son singing about singing about fighting ninjas fight the ninja and, Gotta and fight friendship the ninja. and friendship <laughs> that's right i mean come on it's the greatest movie ever uh but yeah so i a buddy of mine uh it's funny we, we're talking about miami connection because that was the that was the movie somebody else saw that i know and they were mm. like, dude, this is the worst movie I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> and I gave them the Manos Hands of Fate Challenge because it's actually mm. on YouTube without cheating, without, I the, know, I know. without the Mystery Science Theater or Riff Tracks, like just the movie. And I said, watch it. And I, I guarantee you within 10 to 15 minutes, you're going to tap. He's like, man, I got this. <laughs> He's like, I got this. This ain't nothing. 10, 15, I think it was 10 minutes, maybe eight minutes. He's like, I can't do this. And I was <laughs> laughing. I was like, yeah, that's bad. If you want to talk bad. But anyway, uh, yeah, Torgo and friends, you know, we, we love us some Torgo. Torgo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, you know, in this episode, Torgo showing up at the end of the, you know, delivering pizza was hilarious. Mm -hmm. But the, this was the shot. I'm going to, I'm going to show it right now for chat and everybody watching. My buddy goes, he sent me this. He's like, dude, this guy's awesome. I just discovered his artwork. 
check this out. Boom. He sent it to me uh, via uh, Instagram. Bam, baby. (laughs) Yes. I was like, yo, what is like, oh my God, I got to look up this guy's stuff. <laughs> but yeah, it has the whole retro pulp vibe and look to, to this, man. It's great. You know? Thank you. But yeah, this, this is great. This one I was looking at a lot of, uh, I was looking at Robert McGinnis covers. He did a lot of like uh, kind of action and thriller covers in the sixties. And there was always, a, yeah. you know, a sexy woman being menaced. Right. And, you know, looking back at it, cause I'm not, this is a problem is like, I'm always hypercritical of my own work. So like, I always see the things that are in my mind, like the, the flaws. So I'm like, Oh, I really should have pushed the beginner stuff more. I should have done like more texture in the back and like right. just really elongated her and made her like one of those skinny supermodels. But right. I still, I still like the piece. My, my favorite part about this, I will say though, is the little Torgo books logo in the corner. That was my favorite thing to do in the whole piece. Oh, <laughs> I didn't see that. I see it now. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Uh, oh, oh, chat. They're already saying. Uh, Kaiju says that is sick. He loves it. Oh, oh, we're getting requests already. Do do one for Miami <laughs> connection now, baby. Come on, let's go. Oh, uh, the room. That's it. Oh, I, you know, I still have not seen the room. It's one of those movies that, like, again, I've seen so much uh, pop culture artwork come out of it, and I've seen enough like memes and clips and stuff that i'm like okay i know this movie is gonna be bonkers um yeah. i just we'll talk about what you just said earlier about uh movies where they're so bad you can't look away yeah the room is perfect <laughs> it's the it's perfect man but yeah manos i showed that to my wife she was dying laughing she so was the like, thing about manos amazing. that i love though is that and one of the things that inspired me to do that piece is like i feel like if somebody would were, were to take the idea of the story and take all the elements and remake it with, you know, talent and yeah. a camera that could hold more than a 30 second film reel at a time. So it wasn't right. all those wacky quick cuts right? and maybe a better special effects budget. So Torgo wasn't just a guy with big knees. <laughs> um, but I feel like there could actually be a pretty decent horror flick in there. If somebody would just remake yeah. it. stop remaking classic horror movies, take, get your manoses. Yeah. Get your movies that are just, you know, subpar and just yeah. take a whack at them. Yeah, your manos, your manos is your troll twos, you know, <laughs> which we'll get to a little bit later with troll two. Uh, but yeah, I mean, with the whole cult mm-hmm. vibe, I mean, you yeah. could do a serious. I manos. feel like you can, you know, you can add a Lovecraftian element. You can make like the yeah. hand of fate a giant monster living underneath the lodge. Um, you know, maybe make the dad not so much of a dick. That might be helpful. <laughs> Targo, yeah, <laughs> dad was horrible, man. Oh, but yeah, that I was sold after that. Um, well, thank you, and uh, <laughs> and again, you also did a piece on uh, the mystery science. Well, theater mystery box. science theater was, um, I discovered it in college. Uh, my roommate was a huge mystery science theater fan, he's like, You gotta watch this. And at that time, I was on Comedy Central, it was like, like two in the morning or something ridiculous, which yeah. is you know, now it's like feels like hell to me but back then i was like oh yeah two in the morning no big deal and i just fell in love with it because i i i love that old cheesy sci-fi stuff and oh, yeah. um so then when time came and we were able to do um you know doing a, a television theme show for gallery 1988 this is the first one that popped in my mind i'm like i gotta oh, yeah. do msc3k the only hard part was editing down which episodes to put in the background it's like i gotta find ones that you can mostly identify yeah, but you know, had to throw in some personal favorites like you yeah. know, like Manos there, the master. Manos, I see uh, the brain that wouldn't die there. The brain that went ah, oh, such I'm a good one. Some Tor Johnson down yep, there. Yep, Trumpy's kind of hidden behind the title, but you can see <laughs> his trunk there. There's uh the chicken, uh, Captain Chicken Man from yeah. Crankor from yeah. one of the Japanese uh, <laughs> sci-fi hero movies. Prince of in Space is one of those. One of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah Prince yeah, of Space yeah. or Space Chief. Yeah. I forget which one. Space Chief. Man, we're just going to talk Mystery Science Theater. I know. Crazy, that's man. We're going to hijack it and just talk MC3K <laughs> I, don't have, time. I don't have a problem with that. But I love <laughs> how you uh, did uh, Tom Servo and Joel, and Joel Hodgson and uh, uh, Crow T. Robot. G- great stuff, man. Definitely. Thank you. Definitely. It's actually my daughter was only a couple months old when I did that. And I have a picture of her somewhere like sitting on my lap as I'm painting Crow and like doing the shadow detail yeah. on it. So it's pretty fun. It's a pretty fun snapshot of where I was at that time. 
Nice, nice. Now, do you do uh, advertisements as well here? Well, this was for a show in uh, for 1988 that was all based upon L.A. It's uh, okay. they, every year, every couple of years, they do a, a We Love L.A. show. Gotcha. And uh, I've only been a couple times out to, like I said uh, earlier before we started, I have a brother who lives out there. He's got his own uh, trailer cutting company. Yeah. Um, but the few times that we've gone out there, like one of the things my wife and I always did is like, we got to hit in and out burger. So <laughs> when he said like LA show, I'm like, that's the first thing that popped in my head. Like big, you know, nerd that I am like, Oh, yeah. in and out burger. Those are yeah. good burgers. So then, uh, I took that idea and the whole animal style secret menu and then yeah. uh, kind of yeah. gave it like an EC comics treatment. With Love that. It. And yeah, this was, this was a favorite one. And this is one of the ones, um, I said again before we started, you know, the broadcast that I'm amazed that uh, that you know people respond to my work that you know feel about it the same way I do, which is it's a great feeling. And somebody has this original painting. This is uh, me. I posed for, and my wife took the picture. So someone has a painting on their wall of me as a werewolf eating an In and Out burger, and that is the most bonkers shit I can. <laughs> <laughs> like every time I think of that, I'm like, who? But who has it? It's like amazing to me. Wow, wow. But yeah, Wolfman eating the In N Out Burger, animal styles, great. Love it. Uh chat over here saying uh great artwork, dude. Thank you. Right here. Uh Flix is in the house. It says beautiful. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, they're they're digging it, my friend. Now, when when was the first time you saw Troll 2? Oh, jeez. Um <laughs> Um, pretty recently, my, my horror movie and sci-fi movie knowledge actually came a lot later than, you know, some people I, I know who are other artists or people who are fans of like, you know, I used yeah. to see it when I was like eight years old and stuff and like, it never happened that way for me. Yeah. Um, it was pretty much college or beyond and some stuff in high school. Troll two is, I would say the first time I saw, I'd heard about it. I'd heard all these things like the world's worst movie. And I was like, Oh, okay. And then I'd saw it probably about, you know, 10 or 12 years ago. And I was like, wow, that's up yeah. there. That's a contender. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know Definitely. if it takes the prize mm. the world's worst, but. Yeah, I think I think Manos has it beat a little. I mean, I guess there's a lot that, of dead air. I guess. Yeah, I guess that Troll 2 actually did can laugh have at it. some production value. Yeah, yeah. Um, and some Oscar caliber acting, too. I mean, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Oh, my God. Uh, Literally. The, the uh, making out and eating corn and the popcorn scene. I'm still trying to figure out what the hell that was all about. I was waiting for her to kill him. No, she was just the in evil for... witch trans yeah, she... makes herself hot as a disguise just to make out with one of the, the t you know, one of the college kids or teenagers <laughs> or whatever. And they make out and then it's they're eating corn together. I'm not making this up, chat. They're eating corn together <laughs> in a sexual manner. And then popcorn appears. And then they're surrounded by popcorn. And that's the end of the scene. That's it. That's it. There's some really I'm... great uh, drama club caliber acting going on in there, too. <laughs> Especially the woman playing Her. Witch. Yeah, yes, she's like... Yes. Yeah, oh it's like God. that gave me... Watching that gave me flashbacks to like doing high school productions. I'm like, oh, yeah. I know exactly where she's coming from. There you go. Flix, uh, he owns a copy. There you go. Have you seen um, uh, the the documentary? Yes, I. Uh, That's pretty good. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Like to, just seeing the people, especially the people who own it, and are like, right? Yeah, this was terrible. The um, I felt bad for the woman who played the daughter, who was like, I had to take it off my resume because people would see it and like just <laughs> wouldn't even bother auditioning. Uh, and then you know, of course the 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 guy who played the father and seeing his arc as like, right. he really became, I don't know, a little inflated with his own importance for being part of the worst movie. And then it's like, well, yeah, but it's just, it's just a crappy movie, you know? Well, like he, it was cool. It's cool when they embrace it. Mm -hmm. But then when he got stupid at the end, it was just like, yo, look at these people. Ah. Yeah. I was like, dude, come on, just, just embrace it and be happy that you were in a goofy movie and then just call it a day. But he got all weird later in a documentary. Like he was like yeah. looking, he started to look down on the fans. Yeah, he started to get that like every you know that self importance that when people right not realizing that the reason people love you is because you're a terrible actor. Yeah, he started getting like this. <laughs> oh yeah, I was what doing good stuff. Yeah, like, we don't piss on hospitality. I mm -hmm. won't allow it. 
Yeah. And then just I mean, finding clearly. out about the director and how wackadoo that guy was. That, like, yeah. That guy's convinced like it's a it's a great movie. I mean, he yeah. sings serious <laughs> things about vegetarianism. It's like, were you though? <laughs> I know. Although I gotta say too, like um another movie that I, I hadn't seen in years and years and years, and I went back after watching Troll 2, I went back and watched Troll. I'm like mm-hmm. It's not that much better. <laughs> no, no, it's, pretty bad. I mean, at least there's a troll in there, so it's got that going for it. Yeah, yeah. Not not such a high bar. Everyone's like, "Oh, troll two is so bad." It's like, eh, "Have you seen troll one lately? It's not great." <laughs> yeah, troll two, uh, the movie with no trolls in it. Mm-hmm. Oh, Nilbog, yeah. but it's it's Nilbog. Nilbog, Nilbog is goblet spelled backwards. Oh my god, it's so funny. <laughs> oh, uh, have you seen Samurai Cop? This is another great one. I've not seen Samurai. Cop. Oh, you're gonna. I, love it's that another one. one I've heard of. Unfortunately, my uh, my movie watching time um, with a, a kid is just it's not as much as it used to be. Right. I used to. My wife and I used to love watching cheesy horror movies. We're like, yeah. this looks like crap. Let's put it on and see. <laughs> um, and sometimes we'd strike gold and be like, oh my god, this is so yeah, bad. It's funny. That's us. Um, that's us. That's kind of how yeah. we discovered like pieces, you know, mm-hmm. um, classic all I over the top one. slasher. Yeah. Um, and uh, but lately, you know, we don't have as much time with the kid who doesn't go to bed until late, so we can't really right. watch you know gory over the top <laughs> horror movies. You know, right? We don't want right. to traumatize her, I guess. <laughs> so we have to yeah. like actually pick and choose. Like, yeah, maybe we should watch something that you know, yeah, has some sort of quality to it. Yeah, <laughs> but, but one day. You gotta One day, I'm in. sure I'll be able to. You got to sneak them in when you can. I know. I mean, that's Especially how I snuck Samurai in Miami Cop. Connection. I'm like, Don't watch, watch and... Samurai Cop 2. <laughs> Don't do it. Because right, Samurai Cop watch. 2, unfortunately, Samurai Cop was, people love it because it's bad. Because mm-hmm. they tried to make a good Lethal Weapon ripoff and failed. That's why it's special. <laughs> right? Samurai Cop 2, the same original actors came back mm-hmm. and tried to do a sequel but they were in on the joke. Uh, see, that's so the surest just... way to kill a, a movie. Is um, there was some movie? What was it called? Dead and Breakfast, I think it was called. Right. And it was trying so hard to be Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> it was trying so hard, and it was like, it was like, oh, you're you're doing too much. Like you gotta, you you had the bones there to have a, yeah. a good cult movie, but you're like trying to t- check off like every single box of like this makes it a cult movie, right? We'll have a musical number. Ah, <laughs> oh, you don't need it. I think I've seen that movie once, but it was so long ago, I don't remember yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, again, that's when my wife and I had time to watch crap movies, and we were yeah. like, let's just, this looks like crap, let's watch it. <laughs> it's fun sometimes, because you do it find some hidden, some hidden gems. I love finding, uh, like, not just the crap movies, I love finding the hidden gems of good movies, too. Oh, yeah. Um, like, yeah. when you going back, um, mm. one of my personal favorites is uh, Dead and Buried, uh, Dan mm. O'Bannon wrote that, and I think, I want to say he directed it, too. That's on 4K um, now. And that's one that, like, I feel more people should know about. I feel like it's got a lot of good stuff going for it. I feel like it's kind of an, an undis- not necessarily undiscovered, but an unappreciated gem. Gotcha, gotcha. My most recent favorite discovery uh, is a movie that came out in the 80s called Lady Terminator. <laughs> it is amazing. It is, it's, it's bad, but it's so entertaining and actually kind of badass at points, mm-hmm. like legit action. Yeah. Lady Terminator is great. We just, <laughs> we just, we just did a review on it. If you want to check out the review, I'll have to do that. We'll, we show little clips in there for you, but dude, oh my God. Lady Terminator is, is like a delight. Seriously. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to the artwork here. So yeah, Troll 2, I really enjoyed this piece here because you combined we got Little Shop of Horrors, the Troll 2 setting, Neil Bog. We got our boy, Stephen King from Creep Show in the back. And of course, Children of the Corn down at the bottom here. What made you combine all these? Well, if you look up close at the, the basket <coughs> that uh, Jordy Verrill is carrying in the back, there, you'll see it's filled <clears throat> with killer tomatoes, too. Oh, my God. Um, my <laughs> take on this was like there were a bunch of horror movies with horticulture themed menaces. Yeah. And I wanted to put them all together. Oh, and that's brilliant. Do that. Um, this is another one I'm, you know, talking about. I'm self-critical. It's like I really liked my idea. I really liked my drawing, and then when the time came to paint it, I realized I didn't have 
great reference for lighting on them. So I had to make up hmm. a lot of stuff. So like, I always look at this one and I see a lot of things like, ah, it should have been better. I should have figured out the lighting and whatever, but I but still overall, think overall you're pleased with it. Uh, uh, the concept. I, right, I really gotcha. was happy with the concept. And uh, this was the first one. I did a couple pieces. This was again for uh, gallery 1988. This is for the annual crazy for cult show. Um, and I did a few pieces where I'm like, you know what? I'd like to just take a bunch of different cult movies with a similar theme and put yeah. it into one piece. Yeah. And this is one of uh, one of three that I've done yeah. for the, that idea. Well, I think it looks great. I think well, thank great. you. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I didn't notice the, the killer tomatoes there. That, that's even better. <laughs> awesome. You know, my a buddy of mine just recently uh, told me, I think it was like a couple, a couple months ago. He was like, bro. I just bought the entire Twilight Zone box set on DVD. And he's like, I'm watching these episodes and I'm enjoying it. And I'm kind of jealous because that was a that's a, such a iconic and fantastic show that I I've been I'm I've been kind of holding out. Like I haven't watched it in so long. I mean, it's mm. been a long time. Uh some episodes I do remember that I enjoyed about the man with you know, he was the last man on earth. You know, and he had, mm -hmm. he yeah. loved reading books. Oh, yeah. Classic. And then he broke his glasses at the end, mm -hmm. which sucked. But it was a great Coming episode. Up last. Yep. Yeah. I mean, of course, you know, everybody knows this episode. I mean, come on. Like, you know, got some Shatner there. <laughs> There's something Always on the, love the Shatner. Something on the, on the wing. <laughs> something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's some I do remember, but I, I've been kind of holding out. Like, come on, Blu ray. Come on. Like, there's so many. <laughs> You know, I'm sure it looks great on DVD, mm -hmm. but it's just like, come on, because I that I Samurai Guy sometimes it's cursed. <laughs> like I'll finally buy it, I'll give in, I'll finally buy it on DVD, and then it'll come out on Blu-ray. It's like <laughs> really, really. So, but yeah, I do want to rewatch it uh, for sure. If it's on some streaming service, do you know if it's streaming on? Um, right now, it's you can watch it all on Hulu. Uh, with oh commercials. shit! Okay. Um, and uh, since. It's owned by CBS. Uh, I think it's all streaming on Paramount Plus. Um, okay, so I'll watch it. I got Hulu for sure. Yeah, I mean, if you don't mind sitting through the ads, yeah, that's fine. All right, awesome. But uh, yeah, I would love to. Hopefully, one day we get a Blu-ray release of Twilight Zone for sure. But man, I love this piece. Thank you. That's a uh, that's again for the again. Most of these were done with Gallery 1988. They've been uh, primary gallery I've worked with, uh, and they've been great. Um, and this one was for another year's uh, yeah. television show, the Idiot Box show. And uh, I was like, well, I got to do Twilight Zone because it's one of my favorite series. Like what you said earlier, Mystery Science Theater is the greatest show at all time. Uh, I'd, I'd kind of fight you and say, oh, I think Twilight Zone <laughs> edges it out. Um, but uh, Twilight Zone for me, I, I just really love it. I love rewatching it. Um, my brothers and I have two brothers, one in L.A. and one in Connecticut. And we uh, have our twilight zone podcast called sound sight and mind uh where we talk nice. about twilight zone episodes we talk about them three at a time we try to pick three episodes that have a common theme and just talk about those uh, we hit a bit of a hiatus uh during you know the height of the pandemic so yeah. we just recorded a new episode for this past halloween it was the first one we did in about one and a half years uh, nice Nice. But yeah, we love, it. yeah. And it's great rewatching it too, because you pick out all the little nuances and details. And um, for this piece, I tried to come up with, you know, some of the most classic characters and iconography in there. The one thing I'm missing is the gremlin on the wing of the plane. I was trying to work it in. I was like, ah, I don't know if I could. Now, now how long did work. it take to do this piece? You know, I can't say. <laughs> I know it's it's all a blur. I know it's annoying because like it's it's a lot of working at night. I still have a uh, a day job. Mm -hmm. I actually make signs for a Trader Joe's store doing like oh, signs right. and artwork um, because I like having a guaranteed steady paycheck gotcha. and um, you know, health insurance of course is a big yeah. deal. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all done at night, you know, a couple hours here, a couple hours there. Um, and uh, this one, I remember the painting actually went pretty quickly. It was the, uh, the drawing and getting all the elements at the right proportions and the right ratios and everything it took a little bit more time um, to do just, and that's usually how it happens is that the planning takes a little bit longer and the painting usually goes fairly quickly. Um, but this one was also, uh, 
fun to do for me because I loved doing the black and white, but also a little bit of color, like a yeah, little bit of yeah. the purple star field in the back. Um, and then just, if you notice on, like on, on Rod, his, his reflected light kind of behind him is a little bit bluer. And so is the door frame. So I tr- kind yeah. of wanted to, you know, do little subtle things to mm-hmm. not just make it just plain black and white. Right. Right. Now, not, uh, not too long ago, we did like a, we have a show on, uh, we have a series on the channel called Versus, mm-hmm. and uh, we put two movies together and talk about what we like and what we didn't like, and then we all vote, you know, for our personal preference, which one we like the best, right? So we did one for Chucky versus Dolls, mm-hmm. Child's Play versus Dolls, and we were uh, it was brought up in discussion that the the Twilight Zone episode with the killer doll or involved the doll is that the mm-hmm. doll down there? Yep, that's Talkie Tina from the episode Living Doll. Okay. Where, uh, she goes toe to toe with Telly Savalas in one of the greatest performances, I think, in Twilight Zone. I gotta watch this. Uh, I gotta it, see it. No, no. Is this, is this yeah. the first time we've had the killer doll? I don't know. It's definitely one of the earlier ones. Okay. Um, there's also, I mean, there's also the little alien robot looking guys that are on top of the door frame and on Rod's shoulder there. Those are from an episode called the invaders, which was written by Richard Matheson about a woman who is terrorized by these tiny people who are coming into her house. Right. And right. he took that same idea and later expanded on it for the story. Um, God, I'm going to, I have a total brain fart now, but it was in trilogy of terror where Karen black is terrorized by the little doll. Oh, so um, inspired. Yeah. Okay. I can't remember the name of the episode now. Of course, it's going to drive me nuts. But um, but he was working in the kind of the killer doll field, too, that way. Right, right. Well, Flix, if you still hear Flix, let us know. I think he just reviewed that. <laughs> <laughs> He's watching right now. Uh, all right, cool. I just wanted to make sure the, the to confirm. Uh, you never know. She might have been the first. She might have been. You I mean, I know. think probably haunted dolls are probably a... Uh, a pretty classic staple yeah and you also did uh individual episode artwork yeah well, it's, um there was a period a couple of years ago where i was just i was trying to do some new stuff and um i really enjoy the work of people who can work in like a, a post or a um, mid-century modern look or a very like you know simplified design aesthetic um focusing a lot more on the graphic design than on you know painting Right. Um, and I'd seen um, Juan Ortiz did a whole series of posters for Star Trek and Lost in Space, yeah. where he did each episode an individual poster. And I thought that's really awesome. Like I'd love to do that with Twilight Zone. So I started doing that, and I've got um, I've got a, a decent start, I guess. I think I have something like eighteen or nineteen so far. Oh, um, nice. Out of you know one hundred fifty-two. So yeah, holy. <laughs> Somebody f- asked me once, like, when do you finish them? I'm like, oh, 2045 at the rate I'm going <laughs> right now. Um, but it's interesting because it flexes a different set of muscles. I'm thinking a lot more about design um, and uh, kind of just using abstract shapes, and um, you know, I'm I'm kind of a kind of a Luddite when it comes to technology. So I am using Photoshop, but I'm using it as bare bones as possible. I'm trying to do as much stuff still by hand. Right. Um, right. But, you know, it's a fun project for me. And it's, uh, you know, it's like I said, flexing a different set of muscles, which I think is always really important to do. Yeah. Copy that. What What are you working on back there? Uh, Back there, there's a piece that's going to be coming up for a show, if I can finish it in time. There's uh, the 20 Years Later show um, for movies from 1991, and it always makes me very sad when I think that this movie that I'm doing um, came out 20 years ago, because I still think of it as kind of a newer movie. I'm (laughs) working on a piece inspired by Jeepers Creepers. All right. So. Nice. That's uh, the painting in progress there. Um, okay. And my idea was to, you know, within that movie, the mythology is every 23 years, he right. has his feeding time. Right. So I did some basic math and went back and like, okay, so that would put it at uh, 1955 for like a, you know, a good pulpy magazine yeah. cover. So I'm like, okay, I'll do yeah. a 50 style car and make it like a 1955 pulp magazine. 
Hell so, yeah, that's going to be cool. I can't wait. Yeah, to if I to can, if one. I can yeah. finish it. <laughs> Speaking of, but you know, I'm right there with you, my friend, in terms of <laughs> that movie's that old. <laughs> like know, it doesn't right? feel that old. And you're just they like, just, I just it. took part in the 1988's <laughs> Scream 25th anniversary, and that made me depressed too. Because I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's 25 years ago. You gonna watch the new movie? Um, I probably at some point. Um, again, very behind in movie watching. I think like yeah. the. The last movie, the last like new movie I was able to see, I think was um, Richard Stanley's The Color Out of Space. And, yeah, uh, that was good. I liked it. And only that because one of my coworkers was like, you got to see this movie. Like, Nick Cage is bonkers. I'm like, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Whatchamacallit, um, what do you think of the Jeepers Creepers rumor remake? Um, remake I don't. Rumor. I don't know. I feel like the movie yeah. has been diminishing returns with each sequel. Right, right. I saw the second one. I'm like, okay, that's and especially knowing Victor Salva's past and like seeing you know a whole yeah school bus full of uh, teenagers <laughs> with their shirts off. I was like, ah, oh, this is problematic. Yeah, and, uh, but you just I, I gotta. It's hard. It's it's hard sometimes, but we gotta. Mm-hmm. We, it's not the actors or the filmmakers' faults. Yeah, uh, that of uh, the director's fault. You know, they're there to to work hard and make a movie. So we have to celebrate the actors and the filmmakers yeah. that try to uh, make them separating movie. the art from the artist too. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but it um, is, it is no, interesting though. The original Jeepers Creepers. Um, when I was part of a, a podcast called the Cannibal Horror Cast, we talked horror movies. There was one it. episode we were talking Jeepers Creepers. Yeah, one of the guys that I was um, was part of the podcast used to work in. Um, in uh in therapy he was a a, you know a therapist especially like working with kids and he was like isn't it interesting how in jeepers creepers you have a monster that is an old man that is preying on a young boy and it's like and knowing victor salva's past but you know it's like is this was this something he was subconsciously doing and we're like oh that's interesting hadn't thought of that yeah but anyways going back to like the the movies like uh like the second one was okay, and then I saw the third one that went directly to Netflix. And like, my God, that was it was just it's every successive one, I feel like they're just not beating a dead horse. So if they want to remake it, like if there's I think they could do a good job. Yeah. It's a, it, a lot of a lot of grist in that mill that they can grind, you know, a lot of interesting ideas. It's true. I didn't even I actually enjoyed the second one. <laughs> Yeah, in terms of just popcorn entertainment, I I got a kick out of it. I was laughing. I mean, I liked Ray Wise because like Ray Wise is always oh, yeah. great and over the top. But I didn't even bother watching the third one. It just looked really bad. I, I watched it in fast that. forward mostly. <laughs> well, speaking about Scream, mm-hmm. uh, since you mentioned Scream, got some pretty cool artwork for Scream too, man. Thank you. I enjoyed this one for sure. Yeah, but I actually the first one I did for yeah, uh, that was that one was for a. Uh, a scream show that was done. God, when was that? I'm trying to see the date on that. Was that say 2016? <clears throat> but uh, yeah, they just did a, a scream show, um, and you know, this was the idea I came up with, and kind of more of like a poster idea, a little bit, yeah. Um, you know, kind of symbolic rather than you know, right, right, right. Any particular scene from the movie, but yeah, yeah, yeah it does the job. It's dope. But I actually like this one. A lot more. See, that one is I when I was doing this new one for the 25th anniversary, like I'd started with the painting and the idea was turning it into a pulp cover, which I, I did. Um, and then as I was painting, I'm like, I feel like this looks like a gallo. Yeah. This looks like a gallo painting. It was like, yeah. you know, have all these books on horror movies and horror movie posters. And I'm looking at them like it's like it's feeling really Italian horror of the 60s. Yeah. So I'm like, why not? So my first edition of prints sold out in the gallery and they um, said, hey, do you want to do a variant? I said, I think I have an idea. (laughs) So I did a terrible job translating the tagline into Italian using (laughs) like online translations. Um, I tried to like triple check it and like get it as close as I could. But somebody from Italy informed me like it still is wrong. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, this was a lot of fun to do. And this was when I did the first one with the, the hand reaching for the phone. This was an alternate concept that I had drawn way back then. And I was like, I don't know if I can yeah. make that work. And then, you know, when I came back to it, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go ahead with it. And this one was another one where um, once I had had all the elements drawn out and it took a little bit more time, the painting was so fast and so fun on this one. 
Um, I think my favorite thing was just painting all those like wacky tatters of the robes just flying yeah. out. Yeah, it's pretty awesome, man, for sure. You got uh, Jake Hall here saying he loves the design. There you Thanks, go. Jake. There you go. Yeah, that one's pretty dope. Let's keep it rocking and rolling here. <laughs> There's so much to look at. All right, so you mentioned earlier you're talking about Flash Gordon. So I want yes. you to be honest with Flash Gordon. Yes. Flash, be honest. Did you always love this movie? Always. 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 Oh, I saw it when I was a kid. I, this is jealous. one of the, this is one of the okay. movies I saw I when I was a hope. kid. All right, go ahead. Um, and it used to play on. We used to. I used to live in Southern Connecticut, and we'd get a uh, WPIX Channel Eleven, which would play the same movies year after year. It's like they had one uh, shelf full of movies they could play, and damn it, yeah. they were going to play them. Uh, and Flash Gordon every year, and uh, I loved it because when I was a kid, you know, it has that same sensibility as like the old Batman TV show. It's campy, right? But when you're a kid, you don't see that. I'm just like, oh yeah, Flash Gordon's really cool. He's flying and. There's Hawkman, yeah. and then there's like a magic ring, and oh, there's that thing in the log. Yeah. Oh man! And then, then you know, I watched it again, like, and I taped it off the television and watched that until like the tape wore out. And then I bought a actual VHS copy, and I was shocked to see like the stuff that was edited out. And this was when I was in college. And I'm like, oh, this is really cheesy. Like this <laughs> is really like they had the scenes that they edited out for broadcast where like. Yeah. Uh, He's speaking telepathically with Dale while he's making out with uh, Princess Aura. And he's like, man, this yeah. chick's really turning me on. And she's like, I didn't get that copy. <laughs> and like all these like really cornball things. Yeah. And I'm yeah. watching and I'm like, I still love it. I still think it's so great. Right, and right. the production design, I miss that over the top production design in today's science fiction movies. Yeah. I'm so bummed at like, I, this is one of the reasons that I haven't seen many new movies either is every time I see ads or trailers, I'm like, I can't tell you It'll if I didn't same. see the title, I couldn't tell you what movie it was. It's like, right. it's like a great out, great out palette. And then a flash yeah. of teal, a flash of orange. And like, but yeah. like the fact that they went so like over the top, this is definitely like a, you could tell it was an Italian production. Like, an, uh, yeah. like if you look at Italian comics of like the sixties and seventies, it's like all so colorful and ornate and everything's like all the women are all, you know, wearing barely anything. And right. it's just, they, they translate that so well. And I miss that kind of um, just uh, Rococo, almost like all Rococo ornamentation in science fiction. Man, when, well, when we watch this in 4k, Oh my God, we were watching it like this. <laughs> like it was like, because it was so, so, the colors were It's just so like, much color. Every insane. every one of those like oil slides phenomenal. they use for like the space scenes, it's just yeah bananas. And then like, I can't talk enough about the Queen soundtrack. It's so oh, good. Yeah. I have it. I have it. Oh yeah. But for okay. me, for me, unfortunately, well, it's one of those cases where it's better late than never. Mm -hmm. uh, for me... If I would have, if I if I would have, you know, pulled the Steven here and seen it as a as a as a child, I probably would have loved it. But I was an idiot when I was a teenager. You know, when you're a teenager, you're like, man, it's whack. You know, yeah. you're like, oh yeah, I know everything. Shut up. You know, <laughs> you're, you're you're a dumbass when you're a teenager, right? Oh, of course. And then, um, and then when I got, I, I tried to watch it when I was a teenager, and I was like, this is the dumbest thing. Mm -hmm. I said, I might as well have said this. This is the worst movie I've ever seen in my life. I must have said that, right? Uh, and then when I got older, many, 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 many years older, me and my wife were bored one night and we turned on, I think it was on either on Amazon Prime, I think. And they had um, those old black and white Buster Crab cereals. Mm -hmm. And we were having a blast watching those. And then we went and rewatched Flash Gordon, and we loved it. We mm -hmm. got it instantly yeah. that that was the vibe they were going for. Yeah, you and know. And going... I was like, and I love Max von Sydow. He's one of my favorite actors. Oh, he's so great in this. Dude. He has license to just be so scenery chewing. And yeah, uh, you have you have such good actors that help. Because Sam Jones, I mean, he looks the part, but he's you know obviously not the greatest actor. And then you know, finding <laughs> was that out, his first movie or? Um, I don't remember if it okay. was, but it was just, it was supposed to be his big break. And um, right. there's actually a really interesting documentary. I think it's still might be on Amazon about 
Sam Jones, but it's also yeah. a lot about the production of Flash Gordon. I need to watch that. For but sure. he um he burned a lot of bridges during the, the making of this because oh, I, I guess I the story that. was like his. First of all, he went out early in filming out in London on the town, and like some guys were like messing with him, and then he got into a fight, and then had to have stitches on his face, and um, the director and uh, Dino De Laurentiis were like absolutely like livid with him because like you got to make sure you don't see any scars because he's filming this big movie so that was like strike one and then the strike two was that his agent was telling him or his manager was telling him that that he hadn't gotten paid and then instead of just and he says so much in the documentary i think he says like what i should have done and said you work that out i'm going to concentrate on the job but instead he got involved and it caused Mm. all sorts of bad blood they didn't ask him back for voiceover so all Ooh. the ADR in that Yikes. movie, which is probably about, I'd say, a good 80% of his performances had to be looped because of the sound stages and everything oh, else. Oh, yikes. They didn't so, ask him back. Yeah, the, all, most of the vocals are by somebody else. Um, right. But Did you have so, so many... Well, go ahead. You have so many great actors in there like supporting yeah. him, though. And yeah. uh, just like... Tim Timothy Dalton is great in there. Oh, Dalton is great. Taking it super seriously. And then you have Brian Blessed, who I fucking love Brian Blessed in this movie because he's so boisterous and over the top. He really just like adds energy to everything. Yeah. And uh, that whole scene when, you know, they were trying to do, you know, what Star Wars had done. You know, they were trying to do get that epic serial movie serial fantasy science fiction and they failed like they, they right. didn't make it but that scene when the hawk men attack the ship and the queen soundtrack is blaring and it's just it's like a uh i think alex ross who is a huge fan of uh oh movie, yeah he is i think he described it as being a rock opera and it's like yeah. it basically is like there's no songs in it really but it's right. a rock opera because the it music is. is such a part yeah. of it Oh yeah, for sure. So but, yeah, yeah un- we, unabashed fan of Flash. Gordon. We loved it, man. Loved it so much that we watched. We went out and bought it on Blu-ray, and then we bought it again on 4K. Like it's just <laughs> so, it's just so good. Now here's the thing, though. There are fans out there that want a serious version of Flash Gordon. Can a serious version of Flash Gordon work? I think a serious version of Flash Gordon could work, but you would have to totally not reference mm. this movie at all. You'd have to start from the beginning and say like, this is, we're going to go back to the comic strip, the Alex Raymond comic strip. We're going to take the premise and we're going to just treat it as serious sci-fi. Um, right. I don't know if it so would work as well. Yeah. So I don't not, know so, if it would so work re- as well. Though. Yeah, that's true. Cause yeah. I mean, if it's, it's such a product of the times to the original comic strip. I mean, you have again, you know, this big, you know, let's face it like this big like Aryan ideal uh human lands on another planet and immediately is like i'm the best at everything like i can beat you at your own game you know it's it's kind of like the avatar thing only not quite as blue and stupid um and then oh oh, we're best friends now after you just said that (laughs) (laughs) um if we take a little sidetrack the scene in avatar when my wife and i laughed out loud is the Uh big fight at the end when the the guy in the robot suit pulls out a robot knife it's like what is this west side story like come on (laughs) anyways um it looks cool steve but like so cool like i can imagine james cameron oh like like one of the yeah. designers is like well he could have like a blade that pops out of the arm or something there you like, go. no i'll just pull a knife it's so much cooler <laughs> um but yeah flash gordon i mean it's like this big this big dumb white dude comes <laughs> and is like master of everything immediately it's like the total american dream you know uh-huh, the american uh-huh. wet dream there like all the women are falling over themselves to to you know get with them. Um, they're all wearing metal bikinis because that's the fashion of the times. I don't know that you could do a reboot of Flash Gordon and not have it just turn into a completely different movie. Right, and that's right. that's one of the reasons why taking it campy is like in the eighties. I feel was the smart move for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what if they do redo it but keep the camp? That'd be interesting. Kind of like Guardians Dude, of the Galaxy kind of has a yeah. of that a little. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess Guardians of the Galaxy did tap into, I mean, not so much camp, but like, a, you know, not taking itself so seriously. 
Right, right, right. Um, but uh, know, there will be only one Flash Gordon. <laughs> yeah. I remember when in the uh, in the 90s, Sci-Fi Channel tried to do a Flash Gordon TV show. And I think the biggest mistake they made was when they were promo at, they kept using the Queen theme for all the promos. And it's like, don't remind people. Don't remind people about how great that movie is because you're never going to match up to it with your, you know, micro budget right. filmed in Canada Flash Gordon. Yeah, I remember that. I remember the advertisements and then it just disappeared. Yep. I was like, whatever happened to that Flash Gordon show? <laughs> and it's just like, oh, I did it. Did I miss it? I'm like, no, I never came no, out. No, it, oh. it, it came out and, and left just as quickly. Oh, so it actually did come out. Yeah, you could probably get it on DVD for two bits if you wanted. How many episodes before it got canceled? You know, I would, I would, I don't think it made it past one season. So I'm guessing oh. like probably no more than 12. Did you um, watch it? I. I didn't watch it, but morbid <laughs> curiosity, I tuned in because I'm like, okay, Flash Gordon, how bad it could be. Ming the Merciless is just like a guy in a uniform. I'm like, okay, well, forget you ruined it. it. No stars. You ruined it. <laughs> well, speaking of Flash, let's take a look at your piece here, man. I absolutely love this. Chat, everybody watching right now, this is actually my cell phone cover right now. <laughs> or my <laughs> cell phone strange, you know, cell phone cover right now is this. <laughs> Yeah, if that was one of the um, that was one That's of the great. first pieces I did for myself. Just um, I had I used to work in watercolors when I was trying to get children's book work. Yeah, and then once I had started working uh, at Trader Joe's doing signs, I was doing mostly acrylic paints. Um, and so I kind of really started enjoying acrylic and painting opaquely and doing all these things. And um, one time, one day, I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna just try a flash gordon piece and I, I had in my head to do it like a recruiting poster kind of thing like flash gordon wants you to join the mongo resistance <laughs> so you know i had uh luckily i had the flash gordon uh action figure that i think like this bang pow put out so i yeah. had good reference for like the little weird football jam and everything and um it was just trying to capture that uh this is one of the early pieces i did where i was trying to capture that look of old time 1940s paintings um not 100 successful but it was a start and it was getting there so it looks like you nailed it for for, (laughs) to me it looks again it wouldn't be be on my phone again i only (laughs) see i only see the flaws it's it's, i know it's one of the worst things about being (laughs) self-critical i just said that recently uh i've had you know martial artists and stuntmen on here and and they, we watched their fights, and they said the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, they're always overcritical, like, "Oh, I could have did this better," and stuff like that. Well, great artists say that. So, there well, you, you go. know, it's, Take it's it something. As a I always get. <laughs> I'm a little envious of people who never see their flaws and like just put stuff out and like, "Yeah, this right. is awesome." And I'm right, like, "Really? Right. This, you're gonna put this out, and you're gonna be like, this is what you do?" But it's like yeah. I'm envious of that confidence. At the same time, I'm like, ah. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm critical because it, you know, it yeah. always means Con- there's something to shoot to improve. Constructive criticism, and and you want to improve and get better anyway, which just makes you better. So there's nothing wrong with it, man. Jake Hall says, "Cool artwork of Flash Gordon." Thank yeah. you, Jake. Loving it there. So speaking of pulp characters, mm-hmm. let tell me what you know about Doc Savage, the Man of Bronze. Help me here, <laughs> please, because I've I'm... seen I've seen Doc Savage comics. I've never read them. I know he's been out like forever, mm-hmm. and I, there was actually a movie, right? That yep, came there was out a the movie 70s? that came out in the late seventies or early eighties. Um, Did it suck or it got its budget slashed? Um, oh, that was no. one of the things. James Bama, who is the illustrator who did the artwork that's most so closely associated with Doc Savage. Now he did a bunch of paperback covers in the sixties, wherein um, usually monochromatic uh, Doc fighting some kind of menace made him really big, like larger than life had a very pointy widow's peak haircut. Right. Um, but James Bono had done, uh, all these covers and he was, um, I think he was part of the production design of this movie that was supposed to shoot. And in uh, a book of his artwork, he talks about how like before the movie was set to shoot, like the studio, decided they didn't want to spend the money that they had allotted and slash oh, the budget. And what that should sucks. have been, they were trying to get that Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of big yeah. action, old time vibe. And instead it just, I it got made. And I think it just promptly sank because they probably uh, didn't even promote it. Um, I know 
not too much about the character except that he's supposed to be again kind of like this ultimate not a superhuman but like the superman like super intelligent uh scientist uh Athlete. athletically fit yeah, like kind of yeah. like a batman kind of thing yeah yeah but kind of and, an adventurer um, type. yeah right? and he had a group of people who helped him out like he had like a four or five guys who all of you know provided assistance and um and he started in the, in the pulps in the in the 40s uh walter i want to say it was walter baumhafer baumhofer i think i'm pronouncing that maybe correctly um did many of the color covers for uh doc savage and uh, a lot of them have become kind of iconic you know him being grabbed by a giant green hand holding him right. up and like all stuff like that uh, but it was really james bama's artwork that um Gotcha. cemented the image of doc savage in most people's heads okay okay the last thing i heard that was doc savagey was uh they were going to do a movie they were going to bring the character back and he was going to be played by the rock dwayne johnson that was the last thing i heard i mean he I definitely has the physique right <laughs> right right but that just the, the this the rock playing that kind of character indiana jones type of character it would i mean he can't do it now because he was just in jungle cruise but mm -hmm. um <laughs> unless doc savage turned into jungle cruise you never know maybe the original idea was like ah oh, fuck fuck doc savage we'll just do jungle cruise <laughs> like, i don't well, know maybe well, it's like the original script was like doc savage yeah. in the jungle and like yep. you know disney is <laughs> doing all movies based on their rides mm -hmm. what if we took out the doc savage and played up the jungle yeah, yeah. It's not Could outside be. the realm of possibility. Yeah. I was just thinking that it would probably have to be campy and fun if The Rock's playing that kind of role. I don't think they're going to have a serious Doc Savage movie. I don't know. I mean, it'd be tough because, it, like, the thing that makes Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Indiana Jones movies work is that Harrison Ford, even though he's in great shape, is not the, he's not The Rock. You know, he's not Dwayne right. Johnson. He's not Lou Ferrigno. He's not a bodybuilder. Right. And if you wanted to do Doc Savage as he was drawn, it was like, this guy's invincible. He, like, bullets yeah. would bounce off his pecs. You know, like, he yeah. wouldn't. What kind, of trouble of could this, what kind of trouble could this guy get into? <laughs> I know, right? Did you know if he had the character had a weakness? I do not know. Um, probably not because, you know, he's a perfect man. So what weakness <laughs> right. would he have? <laughs> <laughs> There is no weakness. No weakness. All right. So I can tell, and I'm sure you can agree with me, that we both love us some Ghostbusters. Oh, yes. It's one of the greatest movies of all time. I, I, I would argue definitely, like, if not the greatest, one of, one of the most perfectly written, acted, conceived yeah. movies ever. Five stars. Five stars for sure. <laughs> um, Are you going to check out Afterlife? Are you going to give Afterlife a shot? You know, I am. Um. Yeah, me I, too. This is again, this is me sounding like an old crank because I'm like, ah, movies were better when I did everything with practical effects. You only, you like, only be honest right now, you look young. Well, thank you. I Compared to that. me. Um, well, it's because <laughs> my, my lighting is such that it's hiding all the gray hairs. I'm Father Time over here, bro. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's just salt and pepper is not where it's, you know. You know but, but yeah, um, go ahead. But, I would, I would, I, off the bat, I thought you were a lot younger than me. So but oh, we'll, well, we'll, we're not going to name angels, angels here <laughs> live. We have some dignity, but, but yeah, go ahead. Go um, I saw the trailer or the, uh, not the trailer. I haven't seen the, the full trailer. I've seen like the teasers and I saw the scene with the little stay puffed marshmallow men walking around. And I, I was on board with like, okay, Ghostbusters. Okay. Paul Rudd. Uh, you know, he's charming as hell. Yeah. And then like, I see these little CGI marshmallow men and then I immediately want to watch Ghostbusters and look at the scene where the eggs are frying <laughs> on the counter. And I'm like, this is better. Can't yeah. you see that it's better when you do things there than when you yeah. say, well, just throw pixels at it. Right. So there's my old man rant against <laughs> copious CGI abuse. But I am gonna see it. I'm I'm gonna see it. I, and the you know, and the, the little the little uh what'd you call uh <laughs> the uh no, the, the, now I'm thinking of now I'm thinking of the doughboy or something. I think of something <laughs> like the else Pillsbury, right? yeah, the, the uh, <laughs> Stay Puff Marshmallow Boy. Man. Yeah, the, stay, the little Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Yeah. The We're love child each other. Yeah, the love child of uh yeah. this of uh Pillsbury Doughboy and the Michelin Tire Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, there you go. There you go. But they were roasting each other in that in that scene I watched in the trailer was like hilarious. Yeah. Like what is going on? But yeah, uh again, five out of five stars. Love the movie. But man, 
you know, I had to show some of this artwork. Here, man. <laughs> this I mean, was this another. Uh, this was another crazy for Colt um, where I decided to do a mashup, and I was like, okay, what are some of the scariest books in you know horror movies? And I'm like, okay, yeah. so I got the handbook for the recently deceased right off the bat. Like, gotta have that. Uh, Baba Duke, which is, I think, the scariest movie to come out in like the last decade and, and maybe even longer than that. Like, I love that movie. Um, in the Mouth of Madness, I had to put that in. It's one of my favorite yes. John Carpenter movies, Sutter Kane. Uh, you know, yes. Necronomicon peeking off the shelf in the Evil Dead movies. Uh, <laughs> my wife insisted I do bed not or not bed knobs in room six, I do um, Hocus Pocus and have oh. the, the magic book there. So I'm like, okay, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and then I have it's hard to tell, um, but the, the book, The Library Ghost, is reading in the back is the uh, the book mm-hmm. from the movie. Um, why am I drawing a blank now? Uh, it's the Roman Plansky movie with Johnny Depp where he's a, the rare books dealer. Um, my mind is, my mind is blank <laughs> it's well. gonna gonna draw the ninth gate that one. Oh, okay. um, with okay. yeah, the, the, the gateway to hell in there. So I came up with the idea of having like all these spooky books in one place, and I was like, Oh, I'll have a librarian do a sexy pinup librarian because yeah. you know that puts butts in seats. Yeah, and then I was like, I need something else. Like, what else do I need? And I'm like, Oh, the library ghost, <laughs> yeah, like the library <laughs> ghost from Ghostbusters. And yeah. with that, the whole thing finally tied together because it's like, I didn't, I didn't know what it was going to be the key and that actually turned out to be the key to tying those all together but that's uh, one of that's one of my favorites that's one of the few paintings i've done when i didn't finish it and think like oh i made so many mistakes you're satisfied like, with this I, one. Yeah. it's one of the few i've done where i look back and i'm like i think that turned out pretty much the way i want it so yeah it's a great piece yeah we got a super chat here from bo thanks for supporting the channel bo he goes movies were better when they had bill murray <laughs> <laughs> hey groundhog day man groundhog, groundhog day. day is fantastic Love stripes movie. you mean, know i've never on. seen stripes there's oh, a handful right of your alley. there's a handful of cult movies that i've never seen i feel like i need to check those off like buckaroo bonsai i have a co-worker who loves that movie i'm like i've never seen it still i gotta gotta watch that the, no. i've never seen blade runner i've never seen it. Oh, i'm surprised i know wow. i am surprised too i should wow. see it but buckaroo bonsai it. now that's a favorite in this household. The, 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 did your friend hype it up like it was the greatest movie ever, or did he give you a warning? Because I'll um, give you a he warning. Just, he just said he loves it, um, okay. and that's basically that's basically it. So you know, okay. I mean, he loves it because it's so weird and okay. off the wall, okay. which I can really appreciate. I like I like when a movie is not what you expect. So okay, good. Okay, he gave you he gave you that warning. Good because if he just hyped it up like it was the greatest thing ever, and then <laughs> then you watched it and was like. Oh no! What is this? Because <laughs> a lot of because a lot of people I I recommended the movie to they were like it's mm. okay, like, eh. but yeah. we really liked it because it was bazonk. It was you know bazonkers if that's a mm. word. It was just so over the top and out there. But it feels like three movies in one movie, but it's fun. Mm. But what's what's so weird about Buckaroo Banzai is that there's nothing else like it. When you watch it, there's nothing else like it. It's like its own thing. But what's what's really interesting about the movie and weird, but it works, is that it feels when you watch it, you're gonna feel like you missed the first five movies. <laughs> <laughs> like you're gonna feel Just like you throws know you these, in there. Like, like you, you shouldn't. Should, yeah, you should know these characters. You feel like you've seen previous adventures. Well, but that's it's one kind of, the, of things, the fun of the movie. Well, that's one of the things. And getting getting back to Ghostbusters, that's one of the things I love about the original Ghostbusters, and one of the reasons that when they did the remake, or uh, not the remake, kind of like the reboot with Melissa McCarthy and Kristen Wiig, I was like, I don't need to see their backstory. Like, right. it's thinking about the original movie, you you go in right in the middle. You were given mm-hmm. just enough about these characters. You know what they are. You know who they are. You don't need to find out how they met and how they started working together. It's like it's not important to the arc right. of the story. And right. uh, I, I really appreciate the compacted storytelling of that. And right, so like right. if, if there's any movies like that where they're just like, we don't need to show everything. We're just okay, going to go on assumption. You're come perfect, along for man. the ride. <laughs> then you're perfect for Buckaroo. Uh, Blade Runner, I really enjoy. It's not for everyone. Are you? Do you like slow burn sci-fi with absolutely no action whatsoever? <laughs> <laughs> are you okay with that depending on how well it's executed i like a good okay. slow burn 
Okay. Um, I like you should slow be fine. burn in sci-fi, like 2001. I mean, there are parts where I'm just like, okay, okay you should get be fine. It, but... You should be fine. But after that, if you're curious, go ahead and watch uh, 2049. Yeah, it's I heard lots sequel. of good things about that so, too. So, uh, Ethan says here, what's up, Ethan? What about Bob is my favorite? And we were discussing the other day a whole bunch of movies that are not on Blu-ray, and it's baffling. It makes no sense. And what about Bob is not on Blu-ray. Hmm. There's so many movies out there that are good movies, and they're not on Blu-ray. It doesn't make any sense. True Lies, not on Blu-ray. What? The Abyss, not on Blu-ray. Makes no sense. It's, it's so kind weird. Of bananas. It's it's bizarre. But yeah, let's get back to some ghost busting here. Love this one. This one definitely caught my eye here. For sure. Zool. <laughs> We're going to start quoting this whole movie, man. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> one of the most quotable movies. Uh, and I, this I one like was the a second piece. one. I like the second one. Yeah, the second one. one I mean, the best part of the second one, and the part I quote most often, uh, is Peter McNichol's character. Because um, I feel like he saves it. There's a scene in the beginning where he's, you know, the museum uh, head of the restoration. And he's walking through the people working. And just out of nowhere, says, everything you are doing is bad. I want you to know this. <laughs> and I say that all the time. And uh, it's just, it's one of the funniest fucking things in that whole movie. He's Vigo. Yeah. You're like flies before him. <laughs> um, but when I did this piece, like, I couldn't believe it had taken so long for me to do a Ghostbusters piece. Like, I'm That's like, pretty yeah, good impression, by the way, so, man. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, you watch a movie like 12 or 13 times. That was a movie I got to see Ghostbusters 2 in the theaters for my birthday in 1989 because I was supposed to go see Batman. But, of course, right. it was sold out because right. Batman was it's just Batman. impossible uh, to see. What so it's time. like, oh, Ghostbusters 2, silver medal. Yeah. Oh, nice. Hey, that's a that's not a bad uh, pickup <laughs> movie there. I like this one, too. The girl with the green toe. We got some uh, uh, big Lebowski up in here, man. Yeah, this, this was, was great. I enjoyed this was um, this was one in I'd had the idea and I I was hesitant on doing a Lebowski piece. This is, again, crazy for cult show. I was hesitant on doing a Lebowski piece just because there's been so much fan art for big Lebowski. I'm like, what's right. left to do? And I was like, well, if I think of it as like a pulp detective magazine, um, what would the case be? And like the case is the girl with the green toe. And then yep. um, you can, can't really see it. It's it's a little hard to see, but up in the in the corner, upper right corner is the publication house, which I, I call Brother Seamus Publications <laughs> after the, you know, yeah, uh, like an Irish monk. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, nice. And then my personal favorite detail about this is the the title of the other stories in the magazine, "A Stranger in the Alps" by Walter Sobchak, from the infamous dubbed for TV version, uh, where they like, well, we can't have him say these curse words. What can he say when he's smashing the car? Yeah. This is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps. It's like. <laughs> Who came up with that? And may I shake their hand because that's just so bananas and so genius. Yeah. It's funny because uh, on the Arrow release of Robocop, they actually have, on Blu-ray, they actually have on there the TV edit cut version as well. What is it, about 12 minutes? Hilarious. No, no, no. It's the, the whole movie. How it was shown on TV with all the edits kept in. So instead of like, you know, he's shooting that Robocop in the, you know, in the in the liquor store. He's all like, fuck me. He says, why me? <laughs> like, they actually went out of their way because it was so funny and put the whole movie on there, too, as a special feature. That's it's awesome. hilarious. <laughs> it's so funny. But, yeah, that reminded me of that. Uh, but, yeah, let's keep going here. This one's great. Back to the Future. Yep, this really was, enjoyed that one. This was for a, uh, a Back to the Future anniversary show that was held last year. I don't know, time has no meaning anymore. Um, <laughs> but this is another one that, you know, w within the movie, there's that great uh, plot line of, of George McFly writing stories, science fiction stories. And I was like, okay, so I'll take the story he wrote and let's say he sold it to the pulp market. And there we go. And for this one, I was I was really inspired by the artist Virgil Finlay, who did uh, incredible black and white illustrations. He also did a lot of covers for the pulp magazines, but his mm. black and white technique was fantastic. He did um, lots of stippling and and uh, and scratchboard effects, and his technique would always incorporate like star fields or like bubbles or lots of little details. So for uh, the two in the front there, I'm trying to. Uh, kind of give it this is my attempt to emulate 
Virgil Finlay and give it a really yeah. vintage, sparkly look. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And uh, shout out to your impressions, bro. Seriously. <laughs> you're, on, you're on point, man. You're on oh, point. Thanks. Like I said, you watch a movie enough times and it just sort of sticks in there. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> Every time Samurai Guy tries to do an impression, I just end up merging into Arnold. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it well, is. And it's I mean, not even a great Arnold. You well, know, your voice even... is so good and smooth. It's like your voice is like, I'm not going to do any other voice but my own. Because it's such I'll a smooth do mine. voice. I do my own voice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, but yeah, man, this is where I'm having a blast here. Oh, we did that one. Oh, here we go. Now, my buddy, this, after Manos, this was the second one he sent to me, mm -hmm. and I was, but we were busting up, man, with the whole rock <laughs> poster vibe going here, man. Was this like Led Zeppelin, uh, or, or no? This was actually um, inspired, I, or what? No, it's the inspiration actually came from the original Star Wars poster by uh, Tom Jung or Young. I don't know if you pronounced it Young or right, young, but um, where Luke's holding the saber, Luke's holding right? the lightsaber. You know the um, the Hildebrand brothers famously did their version, very similar pose, but they didn't use likenesses of the actors because 20th Century Fox told them nobody's right. gonna see this movie. Nobody knows who these people are. They're all unknowns. You don't have to make them look like them. And then the movie is a hit. And like, oh crap, we gotta have like a movie where it looks like the people. Isn't that crazy, dude? Um, just <laughs> you know, it's stories like that that you know it, it really makes me wonder about the whole studio system and like how many great movies never got yeah. seen because people in suits didn't get it right um but for this one i took the composition from that okay swapped out vader for jabba uh swapped out luke and leia and uh c-3po for the max rebo band and right. then um the color palette just came from um you know the the scenes on tatooine and looking at some reference of like desert skies and stuff right um and it was just like, for some reason, I don't know why this is. Okay, when I was a kid, I didn't have a lot of Star Wars toys. Um, my parents were firmly on the on the grounds of, if you have one version of the character, that's all you need. So I had <laughs> Empire, Han, Empire, Luke, um, Star Wars, you know, the original movie, uh, Leia, and that was Darth Vader, and you know, that's all I needed. <laughs> Uh, and I wanted the Max Rebo band so bad. I don't know what it was, <laughs> but like when I was a kid, the two the, the toys that I wanted yeah. based on Return of the Jedi were I wanted yeah. Luke in his black outfit because obviously right. badass, and I wanted the Max Rebo band. There was something about them. I was like, God, they're so cool and weird. <laughs> I never got them. Um, so this is my way of of uh, expressing my love of the Max Rebo band. <laughs> they, like everybody, but, when they do Star Wars art, it's usually Cantina band, and they do the aliens right, from the right. first movie. And give them a shout out. And it's like Max Rebo doesn't get enough love. So, <laughs> but yeah, I love the whole rock poster vibe. Yeah, this so. is um, Gallery nineteen eighty just had their fake gigs posters uh, show where it's all fake concerts from movies and television. Um, and I've actually, I've got a, that edition sold out. So I've got a variant edition that I just finished up that I'm going to be sending to the gallery shortly. So oh, that'll nice. be there. Um, nice. but yeah, that's, that's a lot of fun. This is their second fake gig show. And, uh, it's, there's when you, when you really look into it, there's so many concerts from fictional bands and, uh, you know, yeah. it's just, there's a wealth to plumb there. And I've seen some stuff on the show that, uh, I didn't. I had forgotten existed. I'm like, oh shit! That yeah, that was a thing when they had this like this band play the show or whatever. And it was yeah. it's a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah, love it. But now you're continuing to make me laugh here. All right, like you're <laughs> <laughs> inconceivable. This one is. I've I've said before that this is like if you want to say like desert island movie like what movie would i pick it would be princess bride my wife oh, yeah my wife says no you do clue that would be your movie because like you want to watch clue more than any other movie i'm like mm, maybe but like princess bride is one of my favorites and uh i decided this was uh the cult movie show and i i wanted to pay tribute to princess bride and i was yeah. trying to think of like what to do and like what would be fun and i had drawings of like you know dread pirate roberts and the sword fight with inigo uh -huh. and like you know i was like well that's, that's okay but you know it's right. kind of basic and then i was looking at um old pulp magazines for reference i have a bunch of reference books with uh, images of covers and i noticed that like right. skulls so often like big skulls on the cover i'm like okay i can see that with 
the battle of wits. And then it's like, <laughs> and then after that, like my favorite thing was like taking all the little details from the movie's dialogue and putting it on the text and like, you know, the incredible stories of it's, it's what, you know, Peter Falk says to the grandson, you got fencing, fighting, torture, revenge, giants, monsters, true love, you know, all those things. Um, and I was like, oh, that's great. Got to put that in. And then, you know, obviously, you know, having Vizzini, Wallace Shawn looking cocky as the, the specter of death is looming behind him. <laughs> it's just, it's my, that's and then of course, having the, the author of the story be S. Morgan Stern, as it is in the, you know, the author of the original yeah. book, supposedly. Um, yeah, this is, this is another one where I'm like, I, I think I nailed it. You know, I don't, I don't oh, see, yeah. I don't see anything here that I would necessarily change. It's all about the laugh. Oh the, his laugh that whole and he scene dies and just kills over. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to trick me into revealing something. It won't work. It already has worked. You've revealed everything. <laughs> Again with the impressions, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> I think I think my favorite was the guy. Was it the uh, uh what was it the the the, the guy torturing? Bino or yeah, what was Christopher? his line? No, 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 no. This- yeah, <laughs> don't even think about trying to escape. Yeah, <laughs> and then oh, Chris, the yeah, Chris Guest is great. Like yeah. Chris Sarandon, like I, I have such an appreciation of Chris Sarandon between this movie and Fright Night. Like, yes, it's just comforting. He was just on fire in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, but the pit of despair. <laughs> oh, it's great, great. Yeah, Who, doesn't Who doesn't love Terminator? Who doesn't love Terminator? Come on. Oh now. yeah. I mean, now we're talking. Now we're talking. I mean, I even love Lady Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, man, I love this uh, retro inspired piece here for t- for the terms. Mm. Yeah, man. Now uh, down there, is that supposed to? Are they just regular people running away? I took reference for this because that... again, I'm I'm trying to set it back into you know the the fifties. Okay. Um. So I took reference for the image of them. It's supposed to represent like what if the Terminator was set in the fifties, and that's Sarah Connor, and um, right, Kyle Reese. Um, I figured that's who was running away. But for reference, I took um, Kevin McCarthy and I uh, can't remember the woman who played the female lead in uh, the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, they had some great stills of them running from the crowds of pod people. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. Like they got the wardrobe and everything. So I took the reference from there. And then um, this was another one where I went through a lot of different um, design possibilities for the composition. I started off thinking of the end of the movie where this uh the metal endoskeleton is coming through the fire at them yeah and she's trying yeah. to get him out of the way and i had some drawings of that and it just wasn't working it felt very similar mm. to like a lot of things and i was like okay i'm gonna go again go less literal go more symbolic and just do the giant head thing which again it's like it's it's I find it's funny because like as I look at a lot of my work, I'm like, shit, I, I did the giant head thing a lot. But it's like <laughs> it's a very pulpy thing that I feel yeah. works. And, and so I decided to do just like the head of the Terminator um, with this blasted landscape. And then and um, my favorite thing was just uh, painting all like this one. If you see the painting in person, it's super textury because uh, as I was doing just the, the colors of the sky and the ground and everything, I was just like having fun building up textures, building up colors and doing that and working really loose, which is something that I try to do, but my, you know, anal retentive brain is like, you got to tighten up, you got to tighten up. So, yeah, yeah. but um, this one I was really happy with. Um, yeah. I love it. Lot Future of terror tales. Mm-hmm. Love that one. Gotta love Ash. <laughs> We're all fans of Ash. We love it. I mean, come on, let's 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 go here, man. Love it. Uh, enjoyed this piece as well, and I picked on the wrong piece. All right, <laughs> here you go. It's like here's Ash, but here's something else. Um, Movie yeah, adventure yeah. story. Army of Darkness. Yeah, um, man. This is my little brother who's out in LA. This is his one of his favorite movies, and for gags, every year we would exchange Army of Darkness themed Christmas presents. And uh, <laughs> one year, I had the Bruce Campbell's "If Chins Could." kill memoir and uh i got it signed from him at a a signing and and gave it to him so like i won that year um (laughs) but it's uh i gotta say out of the evil dead trilogy my favorite movie is the first one just because i love i love the low budget um right i love the fact that they were like clearly just 
kids wanting to make a movie and like yeah. doing all these crazy things to try to get the effects, you know, but mm -hmm. army of darkness, I do I appreciate um, the fact that they were going for that Harry has vibe. And uh, oh, I knew sure. that if I was going to do something inspired by that, it would have to be the Klaatu Rata. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Love it, love it. And I just had a uh, Patricia Tallman, actress and stunt woman. She was on the show a couple weeks back. She played the 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 witch. Oh, really? Yeah, the, the witch. witch was, yeah. That's oh awesome. man, she was great. It was great having her on the show. She had some funny stories for sure about being in the movie. <laughs> sure. All right, uh, Legion here. This looks really retro. <laughs> this looks like you just took it out of the right off the shelf of a library, man. Yeah, this for one, Legion. Um... It's pretty cool though. Yeah, this is another one where I was um, coming, trying to come up with different designs. I really enjoyed the Legion television show. Um, mm -hmm. I really liked the vibe of it. I liked how it um, it was very like sixties in terms of its uh, the visual aesthetic, mm -hmm. and I loved the fact that it was so nonlinear in some ways. And so when I was doing this, is another uh, idiot box television tribute show, and um, I wanted to do something that would kind of feel like the 60s stuff, um, but not necessarily exactly like the show. Uh, and one of my one of my current favorite artists is Richard Powers, who did lots of paperback covers in the mostly in the 60s and 70s. He was um, kind of instrumental in the new wave of science fiction paperback art. He did a lot of work for Ballantine Books when they were kind of um, trying to break away from what the standard like sword and sorcery for Zeta stuff was, or what, you know, the standard science fiction artwork at that time was like spaceship planet, you know, maybe a spaceman, you know, maybe a monster, but very literal. And Richard Powers brought surrealism into there. And so looking at his stuff and like that sensibility reminded me a lot of the show. So I'm tr this is me trying to, to do my best Richard Powers impression right. and failing miserably, but uh, it still <laughs> led to some interesting things. And uh, for sure, this was kind of, it was, it was really freeing and fun on one hand, but it was also a little terrifying because I started off with a, a drawing. I had gotten reference for all the different faces and I kind of smushed them together in this amalgamation. And then I just like, started painting and going really rough with it and just like seeing where it led. And it was like, ah, it's a little scary because I usually like to figure it out beforehand. But right. right, um, right. But once I had gotten going on it, it was uh, it, it really came together in a way that, you know, it's not it's not as good as anything Richard Powers ever did. You have to look up his stuff, but it's, a, it's incredible. But um, it, it I feel like it captures that vibe. And then again, like a lot of the things is when I do the prints, is uh, a lot of the impact comes from picking the right fonts and doing the right blurbs and everything. So like a lot of right. a lot of font hunting to find something that felt appropriately 60s. And, uh, you know, yeah. that, that adds that final touch, just kind of like set it into the into that into that feel. Oh, um, yeah, it works. when I had when I had my solo show in September at Gallery 1988, um, I went one further, one step further in my nerdiness. And I'm like, can I write up? uh a almost a history as if these were actual magazines that were published and they're like yeah sure so i wrote up this like fake history of a publishing house called radical publications and a, a fake story about every one of the magazines and it was so much fun for me because i'm i'm just like a big nerd when it comes to that sort of thing um and my brother went out to see the show and he's like there was a moment when we were looking at it and reading it and saying is this real? Like, did this, was this really a pulp magazine? I'm like, well, good. I'm glad, I'm glad that it was good enough to fool you who definitely knew that it wasn't. So. Yeah. See, I was fooled. You know, I was <laughs> like, man, this is right off the rack. This is how <laughs> legit this looks, you know, from like the old days for sure. You know, we have a show uh, also on here. We have, we have many series on, on, on the, on the channel. And one of them is, is called, um, is it underrated? Kind of getting the vibe here, my friend, with Legion. Um, you know what I'm saying? Kind of getting the vibe here, dude, because everybody's talking about Loki and everything else and all these other Disney Plus shows, but no one's talking about Legion. And it's almost like, like people for, people forget. It's like it, it is Marvel-based characters here, mm -hmm. you know? But they didn't try to tie it into the whole Marvel universe, and I think that's the triumph is that, instead of mm. them saying we have to tie this in 
Noah Halley was like, I think this has potential to be its own entity. Right. And I think even when they did the the last season of Legion, I think they were even considering casting James McAvoy as Professor X, as you know, young mm. Charles Xavier. And I they decided against it. You know, I don't know what the final reasoning was, but I feel like it was the right decision because it's like the more this stays its own entity, the, the right. more successful it can be, I feel, into having its own flavor. Like, right. I, I'll be honest, um, and this is me being an old crank again. It's like, <laughs> I don't get the appeal is- of all these Marvel Comics <laughs> movies. You've seen one, you've seen them all. Like, I liked... Um, I'm finding a pattern within myself, though, because everything that I like about the Marvel stuff I've seen... Yeah. has been the cheesier stuff. Like I liked right. Captain America up through the USO show when he was wearing like the really cheesy version of his his uniform from the comics. Uh-huh. And then he puts on like the new stuff. And I'm like, ah, I don't like it anymore. <laughs> and then WandaVision, which I liked the first three quarters of immensely. Right. My favorite part was the Halloween episode when they're wearing the versions of their costume. Yeah. I'm like, does yeah, nobody yeah. see that it looks so much better than the, her final outfit. Like, could nobody see that? And the same thing with Loki. It's like when they had the alternate universe Lokis and they had the that old That was the Loki. best episode. When they had the old Loki yeah. wearing with the huge horns yeah. and everything. I was that like, was the best this episode. is what I want to see. I want to see a yeah. show with, with the old Loki. Yeah. And so, like, I think, I don't know, I'm just old and cranky and jaded. But, like, <laughs> I feel like with the Marvel stuff, they've gotten so up their ass about trying to make everything tie together. It's like right. it worked in the comic books to a degree because you still had the freedom to read the series and be like, right. you don't have to read this other stuff. Right. If you do, it will enrich this, but you don't have to. And now with the Marvel stuff, I feel like I don't know what is happening. I feel like right, I need right. to watch every single thing, which I they want you to do, of course. Right, right. But yeah, um, yeah, I really liked Legion because it, it had its own it's character. Underrated, and it, it's yeah, it, it had its it yeah. had a definite um, character to it, and it yeah. had its own vibe, which I really dig. And and that's what was special about the Netflix. Uh, not all of them, but because <laughs> everybody knows how I feel about Iron Fist. But the uh, like the Netflix Daredevil show mm-hmm. is like adult, violent, serious. It's just kind of you know fans would love to see Charlie Cox who plays uh, Matt Mur- uh, Murdock in uh, MCU. It's like that would be fun. That would be cool. I'm not gonna lie. I'm I'd be I would be kind of up for that. But you know we it, it, I, I, we need something for adults too. We need variety. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it would be cool if Disney had their own little Marvel Knights section of movies where we could still have punisher blow someone's head up (laughs) you know what i'm saying like you could still have the hey let's go on adventures with Groot. Groot adventures right you can have all these fun stuff and you can have your horror stuff let's bring in ghost rider let's bring in all you know what i mean that's why i'm kind of fingers crossed for the next doctor strange movie well it's funny because the i again i haven't seen them because um, uh, sam raimi's directing yeah and i don't know if i don't know if i can speak of them because i haven't seen them and like right. i'm having an uninformed opinion but like the things i've seen of the first doctor strange movie i'm like oh it's inception like is that, is that what's going on there <laughs> and it's like when they first announced doctor strange i'm like i remember saying to somebody like somebody else who was like a comic book fan i'm like they need to get a horror movie director on there and right. do something because if you look at those old steve dicko doctor strange they were so out there like either yeah. you know what would be great is um if they could get like someone like Richard Stanley or uh Ooh. oh god what's the I can't he's not expensive didn't... no not at all they can get magic out of that guy for no sure. they could yeah they'll pay him yeah. you know weekend burgers probably um <laughs> what was the name I can't remember his name um the man who directed Mandy like Panos oh uh, Cosmatos Cos- Cosmatos yeah that movie was fucking nuts but yeah. like if you could tap that kind of sensibility like just think about that visual and like how great that would meld with like the steve ditko uh you right. know other world like and i think that's my problem with the marvel movies is that like everything has been so homogenized like everybody's costumes look the same everybody's powers do the same kind of thing and it's i watched about maybe the first third of infinity war 
Uh-huh. And I was like, wait a minute, he can, Doctor Strange can create portals to teleport things, and he can like, why doesn't he just create a portal around Thanos' arm and cut off the Infinity Gauntlet? No stars. So like <laughs> this, this guy, I'm like the I'm like the worst person to watch Marvel <laughs> movies with. So I'm just like, this sucks. This makes no sense. This could have been over in two minutes. <laughs> but going back again to Legion, yes, I, yeah. I like I like the fact that there's a definite look yeah. there, which is right, missing right, from the right. Marvel universe. Oh my goodness. Hey, it's all good, man. It's all good. I'm not judging you. I, won't judge you. I absolutely loved Infinity War, but I, I won't judge you. But I paid my dues, though. I was there since 2008, man. So it was like a 11 year reward. Reward. I can speak English for me. So we were happy about it. Yeah, I think uh, my favorite, my favorite one so far has been Guardians of the Galaxy, just because they weren't taking themselves too seriously, and then right, tied right. up there the first three quarters of WandaVision because it had like a David Lynch vibe to it. So I really, I really dug that. Yeah, but in terms of Marvel characters and a story around them, this is very underrated. So yeah, definitely. Maybe we can talk later on when we get off live here. <laughs> discuss a future video. I don't know. But yeah, man, I got a couple of more here. I don't want to keep you too much because I know no, you're busy. That's good. Get a it's one. it's sure. a weekend. I, All right. I don't have anywhere to be. This tomorrow. is hilarious. <laughs> Alf, son, going after yeah. the cat. Going after the cat. I was dying. This is uh this is one of my favorites, and this is my wife's favorite from my my show this past September. <laughs> so um <laughs> And again, just taking that kind of vintage pulp iconography of the giant monster. Um, and again, this is one that went through a lot of design things. Like at first I was like, I'm going to, you know, I had the idea of like making it Alf stalking the cat. Cause that's, you know, that's funny. Oh, it's and I had it like in a kind of a horror vein. So I had like a, a doorway and like a silhouette of Alf and like a scared cat. And I was like, it's not working. It's not working. I'm like, okay, what, what do I need to do? Make yeah. Alf. King Kong, boom, nailed it. There, That's there it. it is. Kaiju Elf. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't that one was a lot of fun. See, now, now you see you, you go into my childhood now. <laughs> you go into my childhood, man. I mean, this is like this yep. is on there with like Willow, like some of my favorite childhood movies of all time was Clash of the Titans, man. That like, channel that I was talking about that showed Flash Gordon, this was the other movie that they had in their collection every oh, year, Clash of the Titans. Wow. That's pretty dope. Yeah, I never, I never missed it. Whenever it aired, I loved it. Oh, that's a, that's that's a, that's a hell of a double feature, my friend. <laughs> but uh, this is fantastic. I love this. Thanks. I love how you even got some of the gore there yep. coming out of the neck a little bit. You got Pegasus in the back. What's up, Clash of the Titans, son? Represent. <laughs> We're getting yeah. gangster today. <laughs> yeah, my oh, favorite. Did my this, favorite. Did this take stuff a while here. to do. It's, this took a while. Um, yeah. the, my favorite. Parts of this were the um, were doing the color palette because I, I love doing the complementary colors like the purplish and yellow sky like really bold colors. Yeah. And then uh, getting the glow around the eyes was really uh, that was really tricky to try to do that without it just looking like a blob of white paint. Um, oh, oh, and yeah. and painting the the skin texture Medusa like. Um, when I posted a detail of this on my Instagram, I said, like, if you've never painted Ray Harryhausen monster skin texture, I highly recommend it. It is so choice. It's so much fun. Like everything, all these little bumps and ridges and you just keep on like, you know, dotting on the color to get that. Um, yeah, a lot of fun. My one regret is that, uh, I love Bubo and, uh, I, (laughs) I wanted to make Bubo bigger, but I was like, uh, it's too many things. I got too many things going on. If I do Bubo and then I'm going to like want to bring the Kraken in, it's going to be too many things. So like, let's just keep it focused and I'll put Bubo in. The Release back. the Kraken. <laughs> uh, Bubo, did you get pissed off in the remake when they did the Bubo? You know, I only saw like bits of the remake and uh, it's. Did I you see what they did to Bubo in that movie? Uh, I, they made it a joke, right? Like, yeah, they threw uh, it in the trash. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, my my theory on Bubo. Okay, here's my theory. Okay. Okay, um, let, let us hear the theory. Let's so. go back in time to 1980, I think was when it was made. Um, Ray Harry has him pitching the movie to executives. And uh, executive says, hey, you know what kids like? Star Wars. There was a bleeping robot. It looked like a trash can in that movie. Kids love that. Can we put a robot that bleeps and bloops in this movie? And Ray Harry has and says, um, no, it's it's ancient Greece, so yeah. they don't have robots. And then the executive does a huge line of coke and says, mm, yeah, yeah, uh, 
a bleeping garbage can robot's just what this pitcher needs. And Ray Harry asks and says, okay, and came off his blue bow. That's oh, my that's my theory I, I of how it went down. I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it for sure. <laughs> What's hilarious about uh, Bubo is uh, there's uh, coming out soon. There's an actual replica of Bubo you can buy. I mean, it's beautiful. It's coming a, out that you it's can a get. beautiful design. I was it's cracking up. Silly as hell character for Greek <laughs> mythology, but it's it's a beautiful design. Like everything right here has. I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. Why it's there for sure. <laughs> But yeah, love love the Medusa scene. The Medusa mm. scene still works, bro. That terrified the it crap out of me when I was a kid. Works. Yep. Even with its dated dated effects. Mm. Yep. Uh, you know, you got Marco here saying this guy's hilarious. <laughs> 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 oh man, but yeah, it still works, man. But yeah, I love that piece. I was like, yep, yeah, this this guy's doing stuff that I love here. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's like I and again, I know I've said this several times, but like it's. It's amazing to me. I'm never not surprised when I see people react to the stuff that I do with the same feeling. Cause it's like, I'm, I'm just doing this mostly to amuse myself. Yeah. And you know, I mean, there's some stuff I'm like, well, maybe this will be successful. Maybe this will be good. But it's like the clash of the Titans one was like, I really want to do a clash of the Titans piece. I really want to do this. And the same thing with Alf. And uh, <laughs> I had a piece inspired by murder. She wrote in a show. And I was like, yeah. I just want to do like a classic detective cover and I want to use young Angela Lansbury, you know, when she was like 50 instead of 90, you know, and just right, right, right. Just all that stuff. I have two requests. Don't yes. let me forget them. I'm just, I'm going to chat. I got two requests. Don't let me end the show without asking. Them. <laughs> okay. We'll get to it in a, in a little bit here. And yeah, now we're representing horrors. Uh, mm-hmm. now, we're, now we're doing it. Now they got all the icons here, man. We got mm-hmm. everybody Myers, Voorhees. Everybody's here. Got the puck in from Halloween yep. three. Yep. This I was mean, another another movie mashup where I was like, okay, starting off with Halloween three, season of the witch, my favorite of the Halloween franchise. Not even it's ironically, over. it's my favorite one. Like, I, you know, I it's still great. like the first one and the second one, but <clears throat> um, and yeah. then I was like, well, what are some other iconic masks in horror? So, is that at the very top? Is that Phantom of the Paradise? The Phantom of the Paradise. Up hey, top. points for me. And then uh, let's see, I got uh, Onibaba on the left there. You can barely see it. The little oh, devil shit. mask uh, right yeah. to the left of Michael Myers. That's a great uh, movie, Onibaba. Sam's mask from Trick or Treat. I've got one of the creepy baby masks from Brazil that Michael Palin's character wears. Nice. Uh, Donnie Darko, of course. Right. Uh, you can see Ghostface behind and Leatherface, Jason. And then right over the the person's arm, you can see Leslie Vernon from uh, ah, The Rise I thought of that Leslie, was Leslie Vernon. Vernon. Which, that's and that's another great kind of underrated gem. For Dude, movie. the first time I watched it, I was like, "This is so bizarre," but I <laughs> I dig it. And then when it was over, I was like, "This is great, man!" Yeah, that was that was a, a really that's a it is an underrated movie for sure. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I love this. You know, I know October's over, but you know, here on the channel, we celebrate Halloween all year. I I think Halloween should at least go through Thanksgiving. Like, oh yeah, oh, if yeah. it weren't for Halloween, we'd be seeing Christmas ads in October. So God bless Halloween. Hell yeah. That's the best holiday of the year. That's it. <laughs> it is for me. Uh, Sexy Sumo says, that's a dope piece. Love it. <laughs> Sexy Sumo loves his artwork as well. For sure. That guy loves his art. Now, this, this again, you're making me laugh here, man. You're cracking me up. Okay. <laughs> now, is this a childhood favorite show? Uh, or... No. No, I didn't really <laughs> like the show. i seen it, and I didn't like it. I thought it was stupid. <laughs> I was I was but, reaching out. I thought, well, maybe he no, loves the show. No, I didn't love it. I, okay, I okay. you know, I'd watch it because I was a dumb kid, and you know, <laughs> you know, after school, watch whatever was on syndication, and like, but yeah. I couldn't tell you any of the plot lines or any of the characters' <laughs> names except for Vicky. But again, like thinking of stuff from the '80s and stuff that fits so well with the science fiction, like you can't not have a robot girl there so <laughs> right. there it is small wonder my daughter was really proud because she helped me with this one because i needed some reference for the lighting oh. on the face so i right. you know she had a couple different like colored night lights yeah. i'm like okay hold this one right under here so you have the blue light under your face then we have this light here so she's you know it's still the the face of the actress but she provided the lighting <laughs> reference so she's really proud of that <laughs> well if there's if, if i have to if i have to throw a hail mary here compliment <laughs> to that show this is probably the best thing about that show right here. <laughs> this there you go there you go that's all you're getting that's all you're getting small wonder i hear that goddamn song in my head well that's in the my thing. head I'm right like, now I, goddamn oh it. yeah 
That's what I mean. That's what inspired the tagline. She's fantastic and made of plastic. Uh, hor- horrifying. My favorite part about that, though, if you want to go back to Small Wonder for a oh. second, um, oh, yeah, yeah. I talked earlier about the write-ups I did for the show. Okay. And this one, I went a little left of center, and I was like, what would happen if there was actually like a series about a robot girl like written in like the 40s leading to the 50s with like Cold War paranoia? So I said like the most startling, I forgot how I phrased it, but the most startling uh, Vicky the robot story came with the story, the last or the robot at the end of time where she's the last survivor of a nuclear Holocaust and wandering the earth. <laughs> it's oh like, goodness. I'm just, I'm writing this shit and I'm just you like went dark here. I you did. And the, like, I tried to like dial it back a little when I wrote and like at the end of the story, it's revealed. This was just a simulation from a dream <laughs> program. Like, but this does show like the cold war paranoia that infected uh, the pe- you know, the fiction of the fifties. And it's that right, kind of right. stuff. Like I'm such a nerd about, I love looking at like what the cultural, like what would the cultural impact be of a robot girl? Like in the fifties. So. True. That's that again, super nerdy. And I'm, I'm so happy. The gallery was like, yeah, go with that. And I'm like, yeah, I'll write that. Well, I I'd watch that show <laughs> except to not being a simulation, but I'd watch the post apocalyptic <laughs> post apocalyptic small wonder Vicky. walking around. Hell yeah. I would watch that. Uh, Sexy Sumo said, it looks like a Norman Rockwell. Oh, gosh. Well, thank you. I'm nowhere near as that. good as Norman Rockwell, but I'll take the compliment. Look at that. Oh, man. this is We're having some 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 hilariosity moments here. All right. We got Labyrinth up in the house. Yep. Now, now, in the middle there, who is that? So my idea was that if it's – I always thought it was weird. You have a whole city of puppets, and then you have David Bowie. Right. I'm like, well, what if he was actually like a goblin puppet? Like, what if he was a goblin and everything that he is Bowie is just his glamour? And I was like, oh, like, so what if I have like the crystal ball holding up in front of his face? So like this right. show is his true goblin self. And I try to like, you know, have the, the stereotype, the um, signature Bowie eyes, you know, the right. one dilated pupil and the one not. Um, and then years later, reading about the movie, I found out that that was one of the early uh and one of the early scripts did actually have at the end, he was going to be revealed to be like a sniffling little goblin. And oh, no it was shit. just an illusion. I was like, Oh, that's cool. Wow. So I accidentally, I accidentally referenced a version that was never made. Wow. Um, oh, that's this, pretty cool. But this was a real, uh, this was a real joy to paint. And like my favorite thing to paint in here though, is, you know, it's like the little things you find and like the favorite thing to paint was just the light coming from behind his hair. Kind of just like that glow behind him. Yeah. You know, watching that movie and and just seeing like how awesomely really cool. '80s it is, and oh, it's it's awesomely '80s. This, this is one of my wife's favorite movies, man. And it, it, this is another one I feel really holds up. I feel like the effects work is fantastic. That whole M.C. Escher sequence when they're in the uh, you know at the at the end when she's trying to get to Toby and like the yeah. the crystals bouncing around and then Bones oh, yeah. walking up the walls like yeah, your eyes can be so cruel. You're nailing it, man. You haven't failed yet tonight. <laughs> You're on a roll. But uh, yeah, this is but one yeah. of my favorites. So I, I love the fact that, you know, I was able to do a, a labyrinth piece that I feel like was um, different. I'm, I'm not going to like talk shit about other artists, um, but one of the things I see a lot of is when people do alternative movie posters and stuff, uh, a lot of people fall back on like the drew struzan style montage yeah. and they have like a character here character here character here like all their heads match together and yeah. if you don't work out the composition if you don't have a visual hierarchy it just turns into a mess and it's like one of the things that i i love seeing is when i see artists who can take something that's a relatively simple idea and right. execute it really well i feel it's a lot stronger sometimes than just having like a, a face salad you know Right. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because I'm, I'm kind of u- so used to the face salad because mm-hmm. it, it, it's so many of them out there. Face salad posters. I like that. I like that term. I'm going to use it now. I stole it. <laughs> I'm going to steal it. Um, <laughs> well, it's out there now. But um, my wife was really the one that just hated it. And she kind of turned me on to the alternate versions of posters mm-hmm. that are so much more interesting. And now I'm under that fold now. Like I like the alternate version. Maybe it may be, might be the Japanese release mm-hmm. of it or international release or something like that. Like for example, you have Lord of the Rings, the two towers, right? Mm-hmm. 
you know, we enjoyed the movie. So I wanted the face salad poster, right? And then she's like, no, 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 look at this. And the alternate poster was just the two towers, right? Mm -hmm. And the army below. And that's it. Yep. And it's so much more interesting and it catches your eye than the traditional, we got to throw all the actors all on the, we got to throw them all on there. And so many of those posters are so vanilla, man. Yeah, it's there's so um, vanilla. There's a couple of really good documentaries. Uh, there's uh, Drew, the man behind the poster, which is all about Drew Struzan. Um, okay, and it goes into uh, why he retired and like basically because you know the the trend in movie posters moved away from you know art into just assembly line Photoshop assemblage. Right. Um, and then there's another one. I think it's called Twenty Four by Thirty Six, and it's about movie posters. Uh, also about you know places like mondo and um hero yeah. complex gallery um who have done alternative movie posters um but there's a lot in there too about uh, some of the classic poster artists and uh um just you look at these older posters and some of them did do the montage treatment i mean that was a, a viable advertising right uh, way of doing things but they did it with an artistic eye looking at it and realizing like, right. what will make this make sense and work right um in the drew struzan um documentary all you need to do is look at his posters that he did for harry potter he did the f- poster for uh the first harry potter movie and then he had done all the like comps and design work and and uh sketches and roughs for the second one for the chamber of secrets and the studio decided no we're just going to do we our our focus groups decided that photo you know uh photoshop posters are better than painted ones for whatever reason yeah, yeah um for like bullshit reasons obviously yeah he finished that poster just for himself because he's like i had it so far along and you look at the one that he came up with for the chamber of secrets if you if you can google it now look at drew screws and chamber of secrets and then look at what the actual poster was and you can see the difference like they're both uh sort of a, an assemblage montage of different characters right. but one is done with a real eye towards the entire composition where the other one is just Throw some faces up there. Right. Gotcha. So I love it. And this is like going back to the Twilight Zone posters that I was doing for each episode. Like I love when I see artists who can work in a minimalist way or at least a, uh, you know, just a simple idea and make it really work. So I think it can be super effective. That's my TED talk. (laughs) (laughs) Trying to find the poster. Yeah, and the Drew Struzan one, he's got Drew like the, the kids, and he's got like the you know the the sort of the fountain or whatever that the snake comes out of, and it's just there's a real eye towards the light and the and the colors and everything. Right. Um, but yeah, it's is the it one with just Harry and uh, is it just one? Is it a close up of Harry? No, I think it's uh, Harry and Hermione and uh, a bunch of other people too. Right. Well, I will have to look it up later. I don't want to. I don't want to search the whole time while you're sitting here. <laughs> uh, I'll definitely have to check it out though for sure. Uh, I enjoyed this keeping it horror for sure. Yep, that was a yeah, fun man. one. Yep, uh, Hellraiser. Actually, yeah. Hellraiser two, as you can tell by the that was supposed to be um, what was her name? Julie was that the mm-hmm. woman's name? I think um, it's Julie. Yeah. Yeah. Her, yeah her hand with her flayed skin there yeah um yeah the first two hellraiser movies i really love oh yeah um this sure. the third one is i feel like they started getting into nightmare on elm street territory everything was getting a little jokier and then there's you know the fourth one was just bananas <laughs> although third it was one's worth still, third one's the, still fun the fourth one's worth it just to see adam scott in a bad wig like <laughs> that's pretty hilarious uh thoughts on the new uh series coming out you know that's that's another property there. Like I feel like there's enough there that if they if they do it right, it could be great. They can nail it because like it. there's. I feel like that's another one too. Where like the first movie, it was you know all, all Clive Barker, and then with the second one, like they added a little bit more of the mythology. Like he delved yeah. into it a little bit more, and then after that, it was just you know people just throwing whatever ideas they thought in there. Right. Um, and. I don't, I got to say like Clive Barker, like uh, with his fiction, I have a kind of mm, meh reaction to some of it I love and some of it I'm like, I don't, I don't like this at all. And like, I I read. Let me guess, your favorite movie is Rawhead Rex. 
<laughs> I've never seen it. I was shocked to find there was a movie of that because I'd read the story in the Books of Blood, and I'm like, they made a movie of Rawhead Rex? Holy <laughs> shit. Um, no, actually, my favorite Clive Barker movie is probably Candyman. Um, oh, yeah, I, classic. I love that one. I mean, we're getting into crazy ass digressions here, but like, I love that one because it's got such a gothic feel to it. And yeah. Mostly oh, yeah. thanks to like, Philip, Gla- Philip Glass's score elevates that movie so much. Oh yeah. And um, I, I do want to see the, the remake slash reboot slash yeah. sequel. That's it's good. I that, like the original better, but it's good. I mean, the, how do you compete with, you know, Tony Todd and the, the voice that makes you shit your pants? You know, it's just like talking about like smooth low voice. Yeah, like I, I know. Can't even drop down to that register. Yeah, but, I ran um, into him at a convention. He's a very nice guy. Oh, uh, I hear these. I hear, all these people in my horror movies who are best known for him. I, I hear like all these things about how they're like the nicest people. Yeah, and it's that's pretty awesome. But um, yeah, Clive Barker. Going back to that, like I feel like I read his book that was supposed to be like the end of the Hellraiser series. I can't even remember. It came out probably like five or six years ago. Um, and I was so disappointed. I was like, this is just crap. Like, I, I don't know what happened. It's, it's just like, he. I didn't even know he made, I didn't know he ended the series. Like, the, yeah, it was I like, he took his character, like the detective character who was in Lord of Illusions and like some other characters from his other books. And they formed like this strike force to go into hell, to take down Pinhead, who had it taken sounds over awesome. the seat of hell. <laughs> I think there's potential, but it's like, right. I was reading, I was like, man, this is just terrible. How is that not a movie? Uh, well, I'm kind of stunned, actually. You know, I mean, you know, how Hollywood is, right? That's what I mean yeah. by that. Yeah, that's, that's high concept for them. Marvel, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is what's in. Let's bring in yep. all the, all the, the Hellraiser Cinematic here. Universe. <laughs> and the the pet, they can have a pet monster <laughs> and Rawhead Rex. <laughs> but it'll be cute. But yeah, it'll Hellraiser be cute to bring I, in the kids. Hellraiser, I feel like there's enough there where if you just take it back to the beginning and then, you know, there's, I think with that too, because it's so loosey goosey with what people did with it, you have a lot of freedom where you probably could take it in weird directions. I mean, the coolest thing to me about Hellraiser 2 was that ending when they reveal like all these Cenobites were once human and like, you know, Pinhead turns back to the the you know yeah. man he was, and then the I think it was the Chatterer like turns back to like a little kid, and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, what? how did the little kid get wrapped up in this? Yeah. But like, I feel like there's a lot of interesting stuff that they could do. Oh, for sure. Hopefully, they don't botch it. Oh, I'm sure and they if will. they botch it, me and Stephen will let everybody know. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I, have, one... I have a few opinions. Yes. Yes. Now this one, uh, I'm sure Lady Fabblood, because she loves the movie. My wife, uh, she's definitely gonna love this. I haven't showed this one to her yet, but uh, this is great, man. Thank you. This was again. I find the Babadook to be one of the scariest movies I've ever seen, and uh, I I wanted to do a piece for it. This was for Hero Complex Gallery. They invited me to be right. part of their Shadows in the Dark show. I'm so happy to be a part of this, and. Uh, I is another one where I, I took this through a couple different designs. I had the idea. I'm like, she's got to be reading the book and there's got to be like the shadow of the monster. And I was like, I can't get, you know, at first I had a really close up on her and I'm like, it's not working. Right. It's like, we got to make her smaller. And then it just becomes so much more menacing. And uh, it's just the visual of Babadook. I love so much. I love the fact that they took their cues from the old silent movies and like the London after midnight, uh, infamous Lon Chaney stills. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so much of that movie is just suggested horror. And yeah, that's it's, some of my favorite stuff is like the psychological, like suggested stuff that's yes. not necessarily gory. No, no. But that's that's the thing is it's, you know, I when people want to watch it, I have to warn them too. Like I have to go, look, you know, this is a psychological horror movie mm-hmm. with a lot of metaphor. Mm-hmm. That's what this is. It's not mm-hmm. a slasher. It's not necessarily a creature feature because a lot of people have watched it and they're just like, this, I hate this. Yeah. The because they didn't do anything. Gonna... They thought it was going to be a monster. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's not what it was. It's the, I... the internal monster of the mind. Yeah. You and know, when that's we, what uh, it is. when I was doing the horror podcast with uh, my buddies, they, um, a couple of them were like, oh, that, that kid was so annoying. I'm like, yeah, this time, like, I'd already been a parent and I'm that like, was the yes, point. kids can be <laughs> annoying. And there are times as a parent, you want to murder your kid yeah. and that's the whole idea <laughs> yeah it's like this poor woman is just and, and the poor kid too it's like the whole thing it's like the kid 
that scene where he tells somebody like my dad died on the day I was born. It's like, so he's been told that and like, how <laughs> fucked up is that, that he's grown up with that? Like, this yeah. is my life. Yeah. And so like, yeah, there's so many levels that movie works on. And I feel right. like it's so effective and like, just even like looking up, I was, I was getting reference material for doing it and like getting some stills of the, like the faces and stuff. Yeah. And like even looking at like the close ups of the faces online, like I was looking up some stuff and like I came across like a gif of like the face when it like zooms down from the ceiling. I'm like, ah, <laughs> like even just like looking at it on the computer screen, I'm like, that's too much. Can't look at that. <laughs> but yeah, the, the 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 lead actress in that, what a phenomenal performance mm -hmm. in that yeah. movie, man. Wow. Just really good, man. Really good. Yeah, I read a really great uh, but, you know, essay teach about his it. Own. Teach yeah, his own. It's not I read a really great one. essay about that movie talking about how like horror actors get overlooked for yeah. when it comes to award season. It's like, yep. yeah, because she was fantastic in that. Mm -hmm. It's always it's always horror, martial arts, and and action always mm -hmm. gets looked down upon. Yeah. Like they turn they put their nose up in the air and they're like, oh. It's one of those horror films. Well, man. somebody said once, and I, it might have even been uh, uh, Jonathan Demme saying, like, the only reason the Silence of the Lambs won uh, Academy Awards is because they called it a thriller. And it's like, this is a horror uh -huh. movie. But they called it a thriller, so it was uh -huh. okay. Yep. Some bullshit. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I enjoyed that movie. But now, on a lighter side, this is fucking hilarious and great at the same time. This is so good, man. <laughs> You got Dune, you got Beetlejuice, and Tremors. Come yeah. on. This is my first. This is purchase worthy for sure. This was my first movie matchup when I was like, okay, what? Three movies with sandworms. Like, let's let's do this. Like, the great sandworm race. So I decided to put it yeah. all together. And um, <laughs> this was one of my favorites. And uh, it's, it's funny because this uh, piece was one of the earliest ones I did for Gallery 1988 for their cult movie show. Yeah. And every couple of years it would resurface on like somebody's Tumblr or on Reddit or something like that. And I'll be like, <laughs> have you seen this? And then like, I'd get people like, Hey, do you still have that print? I'm like, no, I don't have the print at all. Sold out <laughs> like an idiot. Like I sold made yeah. a limited edition, but, um, but it's, it's great. a lot of fun. And just, again, it's like three movies that they tickle different parts of my my geekiness like dune you know it's it's so over the top and and so uh it, it's so flawed but it's it's so fun to watch because it's <laughs> so bizarre and then beetlejuice of course is another near perfect or perfect movie and then tremors is just so much fun watching oh, yeah. you know rednecks fighting uh Great. sand monsters and so like i was yeah. like it's it's perfect it's a perfect combination yeah. of movies you got remo williams teaming up with the baconator so <laughs> it's, it's 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 great for sure definitely now this one <laughs> now this one okay so this um can i score some points before you talk about it mm -hmm. i want to score some points go ahead was this inspired by frank frazetta yes it was yes! frank frazetta's painting i believe it's entitled the swamp god yes um, this actually didn't make it to the cut of a show. It was an official, supposed to be an official licensed WWE um, tribute show. And this and didn't make it. Didn't make it. And I'll tell you why. Okay. okay. So first off, the version you have here, the image that you found is my original painted version. Now, when I, when you worked with them, uh, whenever the gallery would work with an official show, you'd always have more hoops to jump through. You'd have to get approval on your design. So I sent a draw. I sent a concept. Uh, I said I want to do the Ultimate Warrior and have him like rising, like uh, you know, from the depths to to right. fight whoever you know. And I always in my head I had like the Swamp God painting. I was like I want to do the Swamp God and try to you know do my best Rosetta impersonation. And they were okay with it. And I sent them the drawing, and they were okay with it. And I sent them the layout with the text and everything else, and they were okay with it. God damn it! I think I, I know what's wrong. But go I ahead. did the painting. Go ahead. Came back. They say he looks nude. They oh, need to have undies on it. All right. Well, that's the first one. They say he needs to have undies on. <laughs> okay. I, at that time, I already had prints made. I had right. already like varnished the painting. I'm like, oh for fuck's sake! And I was it's like, can shadow. you can you can you say like this is in shadow? Like yeah. it's, you don't need to see it. And it's like no, they think he looks nude. Oh my god! They need it back. So I didn't do the prints because I'm like I. I can't afford to print uh, these over again. So I'll, right. just, I'll fix right. the painting. So I painted the undies on the painting. Okay. Gave, so which drew more attention to his crotch because all of a sudden his crotch was like, 
I had to, he has got like these green speedos on. And so like, I wanted to keep it kind of dark, but like, I need to make sure they knew he's wearing underwear. He's not oh hanging his dick out. Right. So right. I felt like with the repainted version, it drew more attention to the crotch. Cause it's also like dead center of the composition. <laughs> like, boom, there's his dick. But it's like, that's what they want. So I sent that back in. I sent that okay. picture in. I'm like, there it is. And then the gallery owner came back and was like, I'm so sorry. They say they want you to repaint the tassels on his legs because they look like intestines. Oh, my like, God. At that point, I'm like, you know what? I'm just I'm I'm not even going to bother. Like, forget no. it. Like, this is too fuck, ridiculous. Fuck that, dude. It's like, have you seen his costume? Like, <laughs> the dude, it's like it's tassels all over. And meanwhile, like there's other artwork that went into the show with like Jake oh, the Snake Roberts. And it's like that that snake is like basically a giant penis like in that picture. And it's like, all right, well, whatever. Yeah. So this never made it to the show. Um, and there it is. That's that's my well, it story. Made it to the dealing fat with WWE. Show, yeah, it made it to the Fat it. Samurai Show. So that's there right. It is. We're highlighting it and celebrating <laughs> this masterpiece here tonight. Yeah, this, this was uh, this was my attempt to to ape for Zeta, and I failed miserably on most of it. But at least I got the composition right. Um, well, I thought it was cool. That's why I wanted to show well, it tonight. Thanks. So there you go. <laughs> so WWE can suck it, <laughs> literally. It looks like intestines. <laughs> really? Yeah, at really? that point. Do you see blood all over the place? At that point, I was like, they're just looking for a reason to, to not do it. Because, like, yeah. that's, that was the most ridiculous. Oh God. Uh, that was the most ridiculous thing I could imagine. So, that's one of the other things about, um, you know, doing the work with the galleries. Generally, it's it's pretty much just fan art. So, you get a pretty free reign of what to do. And that's yeah really awesome. Although, sometimes when you have to work, getting approval all of a sudden that puts a monkey wrench and things there was a yeah. um a family guy show that they were supposed to do years ago and uh i was all set to do a painting i had done a drawing of it um it was going to be peter griffin fighting the giant chicken uh but in the manner of doc savage actually you know what hold on one second i got sure. it right here sure. take your time yeah, take it time Getting exclusive here tonight. Oh. Hold on, let me blow it up. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. So that was going to be, that was the drawing. Yeah, let's I've see gotten as far as the drawing. Peter Griffin fighting the giant chicken in the manner of the James Bama Doc oh Savage covers. Oh my God, that looks great. And then we got a <laughs> emails from the gallery saying Fox has decided that they don't want to move forward with this show. So, like, they changed whoever was working in their publicity department, um, yeah. changed management, and so they were like, we're not going to do this anymore. And so, it's like that kind of thing that's really frustrating, but... yeah. Um, I guess that's part of the deal when you work with big business. I'm sure many artists who have had to do like official license material have had much harder things to deal with than that. For sure. But uh, I would have loved to seen that on the wall for sure. Someday I'm going to finish it because I say I, do it, dude. I, I love that drawing so much and someday I'm going to finish it when I have Oh the yeah, there will be people out there that would love to buy that. <laughs> of course. That's like an iconic scene from that show. They will they'll buy it. Plus, I mean, you already started it. It looks really I know. It's already. like it's it's so finish it. It's on the way. That's right. <laughs> Copy that. Oh, I did that one. All right. And this is still awesome. Wrestling fans. <laughs> wrestling fans. You all so know where to go to get a piece. The upside That's of right. this is I do have all the prints that never made it to the show. I still have them for sale at my website, sandradeillustration.bigcartel.com. Cool. Um, so if, if, you, drop. if you don't mind having an ultimate warrior with leg tassels that look like intestines and, you know, not <laughs> clearly marked a package in underoos. You know, what my guess was, you know, what my guess was before you said you're, well, you still, you know, told me what happened. Mm -hmm. My guess was, I thought they were going to be like, oh, it looks like he's being crucified. We can't have any religious. <laughs> That's what I thought you were going to say. That would but, be uh, hilarious. Oh gosh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I swear, man. The Christ imagery of the ultimate warrior. Let's, let's write that thesis. <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, we're having fun here. Let's keep it going. Boom. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this man. Creep another, show. This is another one of the few paintings I've done where I'm like, I am happy with it. I'm, there's nothing I, I would redo. 
Creep Show is one of my favorite fun horror movies. Like I find like somebody asks, like, what's your favorite horror movie? I'm like, I can't answer that because like yeah. serious horror, psychological right. horror, classic yeah. horror, fun horror, cheesy yeah. horror. Mm-hmm. And this is my favorite fun horror movie. Oh, yeah. Um, That's great. Just so, so much, so much inspiration in there too with all the different stories. Yeah. Like on our versus episode we had a while back, we did a creep show versus Tales from the Hood. And we showed a lot of love for Tales from the Hood because it's such a good movie. But overall, Creep Show got the vote and got the win for the night, of course. But uh, love Tales from the Hood, though, as well. But you got Gizmo. What? <laughs> Gizmo up in the house, y'all. Yeah, this, this was um, this was uh, Gallery 1988 does a Black Friday sale, uh, print sale every year. And uh, in 2020, right? What year is yeah. this? This is 2021. Yeah, so that's <laughs> <laughs> time has no meaning anymore. i know um, no not really um uh, but in 2020 they wanted me to take part in it and i was like oh great and uh this was one i had considered doing for my solo show <clears throat> and i was like well why don't i take this one because it's a holiday themed one and i'll i'll do this so yeah. um i was trying to figure out like what to do with that and i was like oh so what if you know, he's a Christmas present, so make him a Christmas present. And then the thing that really tied it together was like, let's make the wrapping paper, gremlin wrapping paper, and having the one, I don't know if you can see it, but the one gremlin head with the striped mohawk on the wrapping paper. Oh, yeah. oh nice. nice. And like just to the left of center. Yeah. So Nice. That's yeah, fun. You gotta love gremlins, man. You yeah. know, they've been talking about a remake of gremlins for I don't know how long. You know how bad that's going to be, dude? Awful. It'll be all CGI. It'll be and all CGI. You know, my, you know my old man views on CGI. When my day, they had puppets, and we love those puppets. This has become the old man podcast. Ah, I'm gremlins Grumpy too. Old there, man. Was a, there was a puppet wearing makeup, and she was sexy, and we liked that. She Damn made you. out with she made out with John Glover, and that's what we wanted to see. <laughs> Damn you, kids! With your firecrackers, <laughs> keeping me up at night. Yeah, we're, it's the grumpy old man podcast now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but it's going to be CGI, and guess what? It's going to be family friendly. So people yeah. forget, people forget there was family friendly moments in the first Gremlins, but it was dark moments too. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Gremlins Although, blowing up in the microwave. People I got to say, up. speaking of family friendly, um, yeah. I think I'm one of the few people who prefers Gremlins 2 to Gremlins just because I love it's how fun. zany it is. It, it's again, it's, it's, it's camp. It's like we yeah. talked about earlier. Like it doesn't take itself seriously at all. Christopher Lee is is great, like making fun of his, you know, his over the top horror personality. Yeah. But I love the fact that they question the rules. They're like, what happens if he's eating a bagel and gets a caraway seed stuck in his teeth, <laughs> but he doesn't eat it until after midnight? Does that still right. count? Yeah. What if he flies to a different time zone? Yeah. Like all those, <laughs> all those yeah. silly things. So, but like Gremlins Two is fun. It gets a it bad rap. I don't know why. It's a fun movie. Oh, it's, you got uh, yeah, sequels trash pondo pods here and we liked it that way <laughs> <laughs> give us our damn puppets you know we had latex puppets and we were glad for latex puppets <laughs> <laughs> oh man so you mentioned it earlier so i had I, I have to play it now this is or post it now man this <laughs> is got it this is one of my favorites dude this is one of my first pieces this- that i did again like when i was just I was I was burned out on trying to like appeal to children's book market. I'm like, you know right. what? I'm just I I got to do something for me. Like, what do I like? And I was thinking of Spinal Tap. And uh, it's yeah, you got to love the tap. Yeah, I mean, there's this uh, is just Stonehenge, son. Come on. My wife and I just rewatched this the other day. Uh, we were working on some stuff in 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 the studio, and we just popped this on in the background, and it's so funny. It's you can it's watch another this one every day. It's it's another one that's yeah. so quotable too. Yes. I mean, just like so many things that are hilarious in there. The whole armadillos in the trousers. We're up there in tight trousers, and we've got armadillos down our trousers, so they're quite fearful of us. And the size. You, <laughs> uh, well, we don't say "love your brother." We don't. We don't literally say it. We don't literally mean it. But we're anything but racist. <laughs> What was like, that? It was like, like we were the originals, but there was another group called the originals. We called ourselves the new originals, and then they called themselves, and then we went back to being originals. We became the Thamesmen. Um, just so much the of the stuff, <laughs> so much of the stuff there that you could tell was improv that you're just oh, running yeah. with it too. Yeah. Um, Did and you then see just the, some 
some of the, the special lines, feature. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Some of the lines too, just like they're so perfect. Like when they're talking about the Stonehenge, uh, the Stonehenge show after, yeah, yeah. And it's like I think you're making too big a thing of it, and one of them says making a big thing of it would have been a good idea. <laughs> Oh, dude! Like seriously, if this is on TV every day, mm. I I would probably watch it. My uh, my older brother is a music teacher, and he always lamented. Uh, he's a high school music teacher, and he said, "I wish that it didn't have so much cursing in it because he would show it to his students just because it's <laughs> so funny." And I know that like I've read all about all the rock bands that um, say like they feel like Spinal Tap took snapshots of their touring and it's like everybody's had the spinal tap moment where the yeah. pod didn't open or they get lost backstage <laughs> yeah chris jericho said he had a start the wrestler chris jericho said he had a spinal tap moment where he was going trying to get to the ring for his match and he just kept going in circles. he got lost and he's like what the hell oh man but yeah it's it's one of the funniest movies ever made but it's is this the first fake documentary uh, I think technically, Movie. I think the Meet the Ruddles was the first one, right? Isn't that the the one that was like a parody of the Beatles? I have not seen that one. How um, old, when did that come out? Seventies. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that was. Yeah, the first. I think. I, I and then I've I've never seen it. I just know it by reputation. I want to say Eric Idle's in it, um, <laughs> but don't hold me to that. Um, but yeah, I this one. I, one out. I feel like this one really like cemented the term mockumentary. Yes, and like started yes. that. But yeah, yeah. Um, this is another piece where it's like uh, I see a lot of flaws, but I, I also see like where I was where I was starting to get it right and being like, OK, this is this is a good direction. This is fun. Oh, and this yeah. is I'm... this is one of the pieces I sent to Gallery 1988 to start oh, working yeah. with them. So that's cool. For sure, man. Like this, you know, I'm sure there's tons of people. I mean, I would buy this for sure. Like, this is great, man. <laughs> But uh, but and, and what's so great about it, it's funny. It's got good writing. It's great, great performances. But they're legit artists, though. That's the thing. It's like it's a fake mockumentary. It's a mockumentary, yeah. but they all play their instruments. They and all he, sing. They all made the songs. Yeah, and you know about the the folksmen, right? You know the folksmen from A Mighty Wind. Um, right. They would yeah. open Spinal Tap shows as the folksmen, and yeah. the audience would boo the folksmen because they yeah. wouldn't realize it was the same people. Yeah. And it's like yeah. they it was like just another level of the joke when they do it. It's yeah. like we're we're opening for ourselves and they yeah. don't know it and they're booing yeah. us. And that's and then they go leave and they come back out of spinal tap. <laughs> and the crowd's yeah. like, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then um, did you see them uh taking a shot at Metallica with the black album concert? Uh, how much blacker could it be? None, yeah. none blacker. <laughs> it's like it does look like black leather. <laughs> Dude, again, I love, you're nailing all the you're nailing talking, all the interpretations and accents. I love tonight, when they're guys. talking so, about their their album concept and they're talking about like you have you have Fran Drescher's like you have a greased naked woman on all fours with a leather glove stuffed in her face, and the man is like, "Well, it wasn't a glove, believe me. You should have seen what they wanted to put there." <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> And then um, later on, when they see that other rock star in the hotel and are like, his album cover, he's like being knocked on by all these half nude women. It's like, oh, but he's the victim. He put a spin on it. And, oh, it's such a fine line between stupid and clever. I'm like, yep, that's that really is a, the most profound thing to come out of that movie, that there is a fine line between stupid and clever. Yeah, you just have to look true. at Will Ferrell's movies and you can see that. Yeah. Like Anchorman. Yeah, clever. Anchorman yeah. too. Stupid. Yeah, <laughs> like, cross that line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's true. It's true. But yeah, it's just there's so like you said, there's so much quotable stuff in that mm -hmm. man. Like it's just ridiculous. You know, well, we're, we're, we're trying to we're trying to be sex. Like what do you say? Uh, the album cover they say it's sexist. It's, se it's like what's, what's wrong, wrong with, with being, being sexy? sexy? <laughs> sex is and just all the things with Christopher <laughs> Guest and cutaways with Rob Reiner when he's like showing him guitars and he's like. Yeah. Need this one, you know, listen to the sustain on it. Ah, you can like go have a bite and come back. Ah, it's like, well, I don't hear anything. Oh, that's because I'm not playing it now. Like, this one's still got the tag on it. Don't look at it, it can never be played. Don't, don't touch, touch it. it. Don't look at it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, like all day, we could talk about Spinal Tag, man. I swear, Chad, if you have never seen Spinal Tag, make sure you check it out, man. It's a classic uh, mockumentary for sure. We got a poster, a 27 by 40 poster in the garage, man. Got to represent the, the tap. That's right, for sure. <laughs> now we're getting towards the end here. And now now you're speaking samurai guy's language. If you, if you weren't already, 
<laughs> but now, now I'm like, what? 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 Conan, Beastmaster, Willow, Crow, <laughs> Legend in the Back, Darkness. What? What is happening? Um, this was one again, you know, going for the montage idea. And I was thinking of 80s fantasy movies and how, yeah. you know, there are tons of them and they run the range from the great ones to like the, the schlock that went direct to video, like, you know, um, you know, the barbarian brothers kind of stuff and <laughs> that kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, uh, the Hercules, you know, Lou Ferrigno movies. Um, and this one, I had it in my head for a couple of years, and I was like, I, I really want to do this. And like this, the, the year I did it, I'm like, that, this is it. I'm going to do the, the action fantasy movie one. And uh, this is one of my wife's least favorite pieces because she is not generally a fan of like the fantasy action movies. She likes Legend, Never Ending Story. She likes... Um, well, you got legend there. <laughs> yeah, I got, yeah, I got that. You know, I mean, yeah. Tim Curry as as darkness is the thing that makes that movie watchable. Oh, yeah. I think. Um, oh yeah. yeah, you can't beat him. You can't it's beat Tim all Curry about there. Tim Curry. <laughs> I mean, thank God they left his lips with no prosthetics because he got that Tim Curry sneer. Yeah, uh, yeah. we just um, watched the legend on uh, recently. We just actually checked it out, which is kind of funny. That's um, the arrow. There we go. Our guy knows what's up. Just pick the arrow uh, edition. It's really good, man. Because I, I got to say, yeah, the, the director's and, uh, cut. Yeah. With the original Jerry Goldsmith's. I love the Jerry Goldsmith soundtrack. It's grown on me now. And um, I didn't like it at first. Well, it's funny. Because watching I, it, it's good. I like the Tangerine Dream one for its 80s ness. Yeah. Like all synth pan flutes and shit. Like, I love that. It's, it's so 80s and it brings me back. But then the Jerry Goldsmith is so brilliant. It's such a beautiful, impressionistic score. Yeah. And um, I find the the behind the scenes on on the Legend um, DVD when Ridley Scott is talking about it, and uh, he's talking about the decision to nix the soundtrack and replace it with Tangerine Dream. It's like he was watching it at, with a test audience, and some people started making jokes and laughing. And he's like, "I can smell pot." Like they were obviously stoned uh, and watching, but yeah. it, he said it gave him second thoughts like oh my gosh is this too is this too sweet. like sweet is sweet. it too yeah too yeah. twee um right. and so he said we're gonna put in the rock music instead get tangerine right. dream the synthetic score and um which i still love but yeah yeah it's it's yeah. it's good um but watching with jerry goldsmith and also seeing the director's cut there's so much more that that makes sense having said that i still think it's a flawed movie there's some things that really bug me um, yeah. The fact that the goblins, who are the villains for the first two thirds of the movie, disappear and don't show up again in the end. Right. It's like I really wanted to see Blix yeah. come back and get yeah, Marrow in point. the chest from you know yeah. the the yeah. lead fairy or whatever. Um, but there's so much stuff in there to love. And then um, when I was doing this painting, I decided like, okay, so again, this is me being nerdy. I'm like, okay, so yeah. what would be a story? So it's not just like, oh, look at all these movies. So it's like, okay, so what if Darkness came to Fantasia and the, there's the uh, the childlike Empress who is like a font of innocence and purity that right. would be like candy to him. So like the, the story in my head is like, okay, so Darkness comes um, from his universe to Fantasia. And so they have to summon heroes from all these other universes. So I'm like, okay, so who is the best visually... Uh, iconic heroes. I'm like, you gotta have Willow. Um, right. You gotta have Conan. Uh, Beastmaster, yeah. yeah, Arnold. My boy right there. I uh, love the first Conan movie. Oh, um, yeah. I got the sword. Replica. Nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then Beastmaster, I'm like, well, I gotta do it because he had the animals. Like, Beastmaster right. is one of those movies that's on the fence with being like one of those super cheesy because it's like it's there's fun. some it's so there. fun though yeah it's a little rapey yeah. and like the ferrets are a little you know silly but like wait hold on i didn't hold include on. the ferrets there wait are no ferrets in there <laughs> it's I know. a ferret wait I a minute in the back is that the uh the cat is that a castle in the back yeah, that's the that's the ivory tower from uh fantasia from the never ending story oh i thought that looked familiar okay Awesome. Yeah, I was, I was almost going to throw in uh, a Treyu and the Luck Dragon, too, but I just couldn't make it work. Right, um, right. All right. But then, you know, Kroll, Kroll, another one that's like, it's a, a Goonie movie, but like, it's got that great weapon, the, the starfish oh, yeah. throwing the star thing. The glaive. And I'm like, well, I got to include that, too. And then, yeah. um, you know, I decided, like, I got to, like, so these would be the heroes summoned. I thought, like, that would be a fun thing to read. Like, I'd watch that movie. 
I think um, we would all watch this movie. <laughs> and then it was funny too, because uh, after I'd done the painting, my wife's like, you realize that this is just like that Star Wars poster, the, uh, the you know, the original Star Wars poster. And I'm looking at the pose and like, oh shit. Yeah, I kind of like subconsciously, like with the, the Max Rebo band, I, I totally uh, intentionally little... aped the Star Wars poster. But this one, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah I kind of like it. They got Darth Vader head in the yeah. back and then this grouping yeah, yeah. of heroes. I'm like, okay, don't tell anybody. But like, this is totally <laughs> unconscious. I did not mean to rip it off. It's just like, it's culturally in my in my brain. Yeah, it's and fine. It, just came it out works. This way. It works. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It's kind of cool that you have uh, what you call from crawl there because that movie's a fantasy anyway. It oh, just yeah. has sci-fi elements as well, but it's like horses, sword fighting. You yeah, know, it's, so it's it kind of totally, works too. And it's mm-hmm. so yeah, it's like trying to find the most eighties movies. You know. All right, now I have two requests. Okay, <laughs> I'm ready. Hit me. <laughs> he's gonna be so busy guys he's probably not gonna do it but i'm just throwing I, i'm throwing out ideas i'm throwing out ideas all right if you can mm-hmm. if it may be in the future possibility do some kind of montage like you did with these guys mm-hmm. but all martial arts movies of the 80s right big trouble little china mm-hmm. right last dragon revenge oh, of the ninja sure <laughs> you know, some Chuck Norris in there, like a little bit, you know, American Ninja, so like anything, like well, some kind of, I don't know how really you fun. would do it. I got to say, I gotta say um, that the one thing is like that, those movies were never part of my wheelhouse as much. Like I've seen some of them, but like, it's like, I was always drawn to more of the fantasy stuff. That's why right, embarrassingly, right, right. the ones I know are like the last dragon. Cause like, I remember that movie, like watching that with, uh, with show. No, I've never like, seen big trouble in little China. I've never seen big trouble. In little China. Oh, Add that to Blade Runner. Like I got Blade Runner, Buckaroo Banzai, Big Trouble in Little China. Yep, there's there's a handful of cult movies that I have never seen, and I've killed you, and I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's okay. It's okay because like with Flash Gordon, hey, with me, better late than never, mm-hmm. right? You gotta watch Big Trouble in Little China. You know, it's it's one I gotta say because, like, again, it's another one that pops up whenever they do like you know cult movie shows and people like rave about it. I'm like, I gotta There's see nothing, it at some point. Put it put it this way: you may not like it as much as I do, as I do do because I grew <laughs> up with it. But it's not. There's nothing like it on this planet <laughs> because it's a mixture of so many genres in one movie, and that's kind of why it failed. When it came yeah. out, people don't people don't realize Big Trouble in China bombed. Yeah, a lot of John Carpenter's out. movies bombed. The Thing yeah. bombed, and now right? it's like a classic. And uh, you know, right? You talk about like you the got Thing a little remake. Bit of, everybody compares it. You got a little bit of horror. You got martial arts. You have fantasy. Mm-hmm. You Action, have comedy. Obviously. <laughs> you have everything in Big Trouble in China. There's so many, so many genres mixed in. Uh, but what's I'll tell you this, uh, and this this will might, might entice you. The whole joke about Big Trouble in Little China that no one no one got when it came out was Kurt Russell's amazing in the movie as Jack Burton, but the hero is really the sidekick. That's the joke of the movie. The that sidekick, cool. yeah, the sidekick is really the badass. <laughs> <laughs> but Jack Burton always he's always this big shit talker. Oh, Jack Burton, I'm here. Let's go. I'm here to save the day. I'm telling you, it's all. It's all up your alley. Well, now I gotta, see, I gotta see it. I got a list. Yeah. I got a list of stuff. You got a list, man. <laughs> Fuck Blade Runner and all that shit. No, <laughs> you go straight, straight to Big Trouble, Little China. <laughs> straight to Big Trouble. But anyway, anyway, um, uh, yeah, man. That if you could, it's just an idea. Some it's a good idea. Goodness of all the martial arts movies, you know, blood sport. There's so many. But <laughs> my other suggestion of ideas is kind of in the same wheelhouse. Uh, Everything John Carpenter maybe in one shot. Uh, that's a you know? tall order because that's a lot of stuff. I mean, I know. <laughs> I had, I did have, you know, um, I had ideas for doing a thing piece um, because I, I love that one, and I, I also had, you know, notions for doing an in the mouth of madness piece that I might revisit because that's one of my favorite John Carpenter movies. Dude. Um, underrated yeah it's it's i've often said it's like the best hp lovecraft adaptation that's not an actual hp lovecraft adaptation right right um, right 
And so, I, I loved your shirt. Do you read? Oh yeah. The Southern Kane one. That was great. Um, one of my favorite things about that movie too, is the fact that he wanted to use enter Sandman for the theme music and Metallica is like, no, we're not going to let you use it. And John Carpenter's response was like, fuck it. I'll write a ripoff version. And so the opening music is like, you listen to it. It's almost enter Sandman. But it's <laughs> not quite. It I just like the soundtrack, but quite. now that you pointed that out, that's yeah, kind of funny, like, actually. It's, he wanted Metallica. It. Metallica wouldn't play ball, and John Carpenter's like, I'll do yeah. my own. I'll do my own Metallica. Fine, fuck it. <laughs> but, dude, Sam Neill's performance is Sam great. Sam Neill's great. Um, I love the fact that uh, Julie Carpenter is provides that nice fish-eyed, creepy look. Um, Francis, uh, Francis Bay as uh, Mrs. Pickman, the, the hotel uh owner is she does her usual creepy shit like and Sutter Kane and Sutter Kane that guy's Jürgen I don't know if I'm probably butchering his name Jürgen yeah. Kroc now sure um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah man I just throw I'm just throwing out ideas because we we're on the same page with movies yeah. and, and I mean and there's there's like such a wealth of great cult material to to do and uh one of the one of the fun things about doing these kind of pieces for the galleries is that you know trying to find pieces and find interpretations that haven't been done before. Uh, like I said earlier with Big Lebowski, that was one of my hesitations with doing a Big Lebowski piece because I feel like Big Lebowski's been done to death. Uh, Leon the Professional, you could like Google mm. Leon the Professional alternate movie poster or fan art, and you will get pages and pages. Like I feel like almost everybody's done one, right? Um, and I like I and I'm seeing now more often in shows. Maybe it's also getting some newer artists and people who also have a similar sensibility of people picking movies that aren't quite as iconic cult movies, but do have a, a large fan base. Um, from my solo show, the surprise to me was the first piece to sell out. And I, I did a variant edition print was I had a piece inspired by the clue movie uh it was a miss miss scarlet and the, the whole one plus two plus one plus one the counter the bullets yeah. thing and people like went nuts for it and it's like clue is is another one that's like so underrated and i think feel like in yeah. recent years it's really come up and people are discovering it good and uh i'm a big fan it's one of my yeah. favorite that's why i put those watch. pieces in the tr in the intro to the video yeah. you know i had to throw it and in there but, yeah. and it's like uh it's it's one of those movies i feel like right now is finally getting a lot of that cult love that like good. so so many other movies have gotten before um and i think that's really cool when you see uh especially even newer movies that have come out. I've heard a lot of good things about the love witch and I've seen some great art inspired by it. I haven't seen it yet. I've seen the trailer. I'm like, this looks bananas. I want right. to see this. I heard of it. I have not seen it either. Yeah. It's like, it's a love letter. Like it's like a throwback to like 1960s, like acid it's, horror movie. It's, it's like, a recent movie. Yeah. I think it's, um, I want to say 20, 2019, maybe. Oh um, shit. 2018. Okay. Pretty recent, but they, they've, if you watch the trailer, it looks like one of those like like acid trip like horror like sex movies from like the, right. the late Erotic. 60s early the 70s. Erotica. Yeah. Exactly. It, uh, oh, it, shit. I've seen a lot of great fan art come out of that too. So that's right. really cool. Yeah. Well, brother, this was an honor and a privilege to have well, you thank here. Thank you hanging for out having me. This is, guy. I love talking cheesy movies and, and music, <laughs> and we got off on so many tangents, but hope I didn't bore too many people with oh, my, my old man chat. lectures. Yeah. <laughs> the Grumpy Old Man Podcast. <laughs> starting a new podcast. <laughs> Rabbi. Rabbi. Why do oh, they man. have to use computers? <laughs> <laughs> oh man but uh yeah man it was it was really awesome having you here on a friday you have a great weekend my friend you too thanks and, so and much like we like we tell all our guests make this your second home man seriously anytime you want to come hang out talk movies or love to come back show again. us something you got coming out plug it uh let us know man for sure absolutely thanks so much don't go anywhere don't go anywhere steven all right guys all you badasses watching thanks for hanging out with us tonight uh don't forget tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific time, you don't want to miss it. Is Predator 2 really that bad? Discussion. It's gonna, it's fucking hilarious. You gotta watch it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Okay. So that's at 6 p.m. tomorrow. And uh 1 p.m. Sunday, we have an interview with Kevin Lucata, martial artist and stuntman. We'll be hanging out with uh the samurai guy. And the next week is a whole full. We got something every single uh day next week. So 
a lot of cool stuff happening to the channel. If you're new here, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And follow Stephen Instagram account. That's <laughs> right. The link for the description is in the box below. That's right. So make sure you guys follow and uh, buy all his stuff. Buy it all. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll see you guys on the next one. Take care.